الاخر شرفنا كبيره التحق بنا واب الى ان يشاركنا كذلك الاستاذ عز العرب شكيل بن علي الذي شرفنا بحضوره بحضوره والله ويلكم ويلكم دير دين اند دير كوليكس ادرجه الاستاذ درجه الاستاذ هضر بالالمانيه ولا الفرنساويه ولا بالعربيه <تصفيق> نرحب بالسيد العميد المحترم الذي التحق بنا لهذا اللقاء وكذلك الزميل الزميل العزيز الاستاذ ناني وهذا شرف لنا ان شاء الله شكرا جزيلا Okay, shall we start? Yes, yes, so shall we? we give the floor to Professor Abdelmajid. Yeah, yeah. Just, to, just to introduce uh, the issue that we are going to address uh, today. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, as you know, Professor Slavi, the first seminar was about lifelong learning. Yeah. Uh, pedagogy is in higher education and it was meant to set to the ground for this uh, the this webinar because all the issues addressed have come to be uh, localized and contextualized within an umbrella term which is lifelong learning yes professor do you hear me yes sir within lifelong learning which has become an umbrella term because it covers pedagogical issues institutional issues and leadership issues so uh, it has become the title of uh, universities and higher education institutions in general in europe in the united states of america and in many other countries uh, the second was a learning which was presented by Professor uh, Udriri and the ICTs, the use of ICTs and the integration of ICTs in foreign language teaching and learning in particular and language education in general and it was presented by Professor uh, Abujid Bo Uziel and the third one was presented by my friend and colleague, C. Abujid Jami, on uh, distance education, which is a timely issue. And this is the fifth issue on blended learning and flipped classrooms, which are also, uh, to some extent, e learning in trend and uh, in nature. The, uh, these issues that have been addressed are timely there are 18 issues and they raise a number of questions related to professional uh, training of the faculty member and they are also uh, very important for students because they arise and they result in different uh, psychological social cultural and pedagogical educational uh, issues for uh, students. Uh, today, we deal with flipped classrooms and uh, blended learning, which are also uh, other spaces and opportunities to diversify learning chances for students and to diversify the tools and the pedagogies offer to teachers to deliver their, their courses, to make them more interactive, and to uh, increase and promote and enhance the process of teaching and learning with the ultimate of, of course uh, purpose, which is always to serve students, to promote their learning, the quality of their learning, and the quality of their performance and achievement, and of course success, success in their academic studies, academic achievement, and in their life after leaving formal education. Uh, I think we, 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 we need to give the floor to uh, our students first. We will listen to students, presenters. Then I will give the floor to Professor uh, C. Abunjid uh, Jemi. 
Do you agree with me, Professor Slawi? Shall we start yes. with students? Yes. yes, I think it's a great idea actually. Then the students yeah. start first, and then yeah. we have uh, Professor Bim Rajid who will entertain us with his wonderful presentation. Yeah. It's a great idea, Professor. Okay, so Iman, uh, you give the floor to your friends. Okay, so I'm going to be the one sharing the screen for them because they have some problems in their computers. Okay. 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 And who is presented today? Uh, Imal Clay and Lugna Buelsi for the first presentation yes. that is concerned with blended learning. And for the second presentation uh, that, is, that is titled um, with classrooms is presented by Nasser Mudni in the Hassan Snipe. Okay. So, can you see the screen? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, we can, yes. Yes, thank you. So good evening, dear professors, classmates, and all the participants who are attending this webinar. First of all, I would like to address a special thank to Professor Karfa, Professor Slawi, and all professors for your great efforts. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, Iman. The, the topic of this online session is blended learning and flipped classroom, pedagogy and practice. So the presentation is divided into two parts. The first part is about blended learning and the second one is about flipped classroom. The outline of the first part will be as follows. Definition and the historical background of blended learning, models of blended learning, and the last point is the benefits and limitations of blended learning, okay? Now I'll give the floor to Iman. Uh, right, uh, good evening. Thank you, Lubna, and good evening, everyone. I hope you are all doing well. So today's presentation is undoubtedly going to be a sequel of the previous presentations and actually a part of the subsequent ones, as they all tackle issues in applied linguistics with a view to familiarizing learners, the would-be teachers or professors, with the hybrid approaches to teaching and learning, which have been invented by linguists and practitioners who actually labored hard to come up with effective modes of teaching and learning. Today's, uh, or today we are going to shed light on blended learning and I try to show why blended learning may be one of the most effective approaches to education. So the terms blended learning, hybrid learning, technology mediated instruction, web enhanced instruction and mixed mode instruction are often used interchangeably in research literature. This signifies that blended learning implies the incorporation of technology in education. So technology again, you all know that the recent rapid advances in information technology, including the internet and the web, have had significant impact on the numerous aspects of the daily living of mankind and the society of industrialized parts of the world. One of these aspects is education. Technological advances and wide availability of personal computers, the internet, the web, the broadband access to the internet, and so on and so forth, have resulted in e-learning, which is also known as distance learning or web-based learning. And of course, uh, every one of us is familiar with those notions and terms, thanks to the, to the uh, explanation and elaboration of our respectful teachers or professors in the previous um, webinars. So schools and universities have adopted e-learning to, um, uh, to some extent to supplement or augment the traditional instructor-led classroom courses. People on their own have adopted e-learning as a vehicle for self-study on the numerous subjects of interest and for various purposes. 
The traditional instructor-led classroom learning is a proven and effective means of learning with full opportunities for interaction between the instructor and students. The learning including, you know, stress of exams and the homework and relationship forming among students, etc. However, the requirement for the students to be in the classroom on designated days and times makes it difficult for certain students and further the difficult um, Further, further, the lack of equipment in a classroom may make it difficult for the instructor to teach certain topics effectively. The technology-enabled e-learning can help address such difficulties posed by the limitation of the traditional classroom learning or e-learning. However, pure e-learning has its own limitation depending on the types of e-learning and how the e-learning is designed. This may include the absence of the instructor, poorly created or inconsistent material, here I mean course contents, uh, again compounded by the absence of the instructor or tutor, also the absence of a deadline pressure which tends actually to lead to lower learning efficiency. As both, you notice, the traditional classroom learning and e-learning simultaneously offer strengths and suffer from limitations, it is only natural to combine the strengths of the two into blended learning. Learning. So, what is a blended learning? First, let's start with a picture. Uh, with a picture, and as you know, a picture is um, worth a thousand words. So, here you notice that blended learning covers the area where face-to-face -face learning and online learning converge. It's the combination of the two. Actually, there have been several earlier attempts to define blended learning, and I start with Freysen, who found that the early uh, in the early days of a blended learning, the term could mean, uh, please, Iman, can you move on to the next slide? Uh, thank you, thank you. Right, so uh, Freysen uh, defined blended learning as almost any combination any combination of technologies, pedagogies, and even job, and even job uh, tasks. And Proctor defined blended learning in 2003 as the effective combination of different modes of delivery, models of teaching, and styles of teach and uh, styles of learning. Sorry. And according to Cho, Jones, and Turner, blended learning involves the combination of two fields of concern education and educational technology. But the broad nature of these definitions means that critics such as Oliver and Trigwell could attack the concept as ill-defined. Uh, eventually, different understanding began to converge, and an influential early definition was that of uh, Graham. Uh, please, Iman, the other slide. Yes, already uh, three questions. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, Graham proposed that blended learning systems combine face-to-face -face instruction, right, with a computer-mediated instruction. Okay. Uh, huh. So this defines the concept in terms of two modes of course delivery and defines the blends as some combinations of two modes. But at the time Graham offered this definition, computer-mediated communication was seen as largely synchronous and text-based. Now that teleconferencing applications are common, Friesen has suggested the need to redefine if to if a school present. For Friesen, right, blended learning uh, designated the, uh, the range of possibilities represented by combining internet and digital media with established classroom forms that require the physical co-presence of learner, of teachers, sorry, and uh, students. Other theorists and practitioners offer definitions which are similar to those of Graham and Freysen. For Staker and Orn, a blended learning is a formal education program in which students learn at least in a part through online delivery of content and instruction with some elements of student control over time, place, path, and or pace, and at least in a part at a, sup uh, at a supervised brick and mortar location away from home. This definition emphasizes that 
intent and instruction must be delivered uh, mainly, uh, meaning, meaning that a traditional if to if course in which students are encouraged to use the internet for research does not qualify as blended learning. And the phrase supervised brick and mortar location means that the face to face element need not necessarily consist of the traditional classroom contact. Uh, Watson give another definition, please, Iman, the other slide. Iman? I guess it's on already. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. All right, so Watson and, uh, and uh, Murren give an expanded version of stickers and horns a definition and defined uh, blended learning as a formal education program in which students learns at least in a part through online learning with some elements of students control over time, place, path and or pace, at least and um, uh, yes, at least in a part in a supervised brick and mortar location away from home and the modalities along each student's learning path within a course or subject are connected to provide an integrated learning experience. Uh, also, uh, for um, Krasnova, blended learning may be defined as a method of teaching that combines the most effective face-to-face -face teaching techniques and online interactive collaboration, both constitu constituting a system that functions in a constant correlation and forms a single whole. And finally, the most current definition of a blended learning that you may find in Wikipedia is like the following. Blended learning is an approach to education that combines online educational materials and opportunities for interaction online with the traditional place-based classroom methods. So blended learning requires the physical presence of both teacher and students with some elements of students' control over time, place, path, or pace. So we start with a picture and we end with a picture. So here, in a nutshell, blended learning combines online delivery of educational content with the best features of classroom interaction and live instruction to personalize learning um, and to allow thoughtful reflection and differentiate instruction from student to student across a diverse group of learners. And actually here I would like to come back to the question raised by our honorable and actually prudent professor, Professor Sandy, when he said what is the place of men in all this? Here you are, sir. It is axiomatic here in this picture that the role of men, I mean teacher or professor, is of a great significance. If technology here reduces costs and makes almost all books and documents available, if it allows silt study and enables one to conduct global research, if uh, uh, it is actually men who motivate students, who facilitate learning, who guides, who monitors, who assesses the student's fluency, who differentiate instruction for different students who tend to have different styles of learning. So this role of men is and actually will never be replaced by any technological machine or gadget or gadget, right? I think now we have done with the definition, so let's go to Let's go on to give a brief a historical, just brief historical background, a brief historical background of blended learning. Please, Iman, actually, again, the, 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 the next slide. Thank you. All right. Iman, please, the, the other slide. Thank you. So the concept of blended uh, or the concept behind blended learning first developed in 1960s and the formal terminology to describe it did not take its current form until the late 1990s. And one of the earliest uses of the term appears in uh, a 1990s press release. The term blended learning was initially vague in compensing a wide variety of technologies and pedagogical methods in various combination. And in 2010, 
2006, the term became more uh, concrete with the publication of the first hand, um, the first handbook is of a blended learning by Bonk and uh, Graham. Now um, let's move on to talk about the last element in my uh, part, which is models of uh, blended learning. So there are distinct blended learning models suggested by some researchers and educational think tanks. These models include face-to-face -face drive, rotation, flex, labs, self-blend, and online driver. And I'm going to elaborate more on each one. So uh, first, uh, it is worth mentioning that all these models are based on bimodal delivery um, involving face-to-face -face or co-present elements and the computer-mediated elements. So the first model is face-to-face -face drive, where the teacher drives the instruction and augments with digital tools. Um, imagine a traditional classroom for a moment. Each day, students gather and the teacher guides them through a coursework. Now let's say that a student in this class is struggling with a specific um, concept. How can that student receive um, assistance without interrupting the flow of the course for other students? The face-to-face -face drive model may be the answer. Here, if, to, if classroom teaching is the main mode and the role of the teacher is de facto important, but technology is used to supplement learning, right? The second uh, model, of a blended learning is rotation, where students cycle through a schedule of independent online study and if to if class uh, room time. That is to say, a uh, rotation model is when students move between learning stations either on a fixed schedule or at the teacher's discretion, where at least one station incorporates online learning. The third model is a flex, and in this model, most of the curriculum is delivered via digital platform, and teachers are available for face-to-face -face consultation and support. Then we have uh, labs. Here, all the curriculum is delivered via a digital platform, but in a consistent physical location. And the students usually take traditional classes in this model as well. Also, we have self-blend. Here, students choose uh, to augment their traditional learning with online coursework. And finally, we have online drive model, where students Complete an entire course through an online platform with uh, passable teacher check-ins. All the curriculum and teaching is delivered via a digital platform. And if to, if meetings are scheduled or made available, if um, necessary. It is important to note that even blended learning models can be blended together and many implementations use some, many or even all these as dimensions of larger blended learning strategy. And there are many actually components that can comprise a blended learning model, including instructor delivered content, e-learning webinars and live or online session with instructors. And that's it. Thank you for listening. I hope that I serve it to make this motion a little bit um, clear. And uh, now I give the floor to my friend Lubna, who is going to talk about the pros and cons of blended learning. Then uh, she is going by her turn to give the floor to our dearest uh, friend, Smail uh, Hassan and Nasl Mudni, who are going to talk or to elaborate on one type of blended learning flipped classrooms. The floor is yours, Lubna. Thank you, Iman. Concerning the benefits and the limitations of blended learning, I would say that new advancements in technology has brought changes and challenges from traditional to more advanced mode of teaching and learning process. There are actually several advantages of blended learning. I will mention some. First, it gives the opportunity for students and teachers to experience two different learning environments. I mean the classroom and online learning or the face-to-face -face interaction and the virtual one. It also promotes the shift to learner-centered approach. That is to say, learners don't wait everything from the teacher. They can read before, do research and prepare questions, etc. 
Another issue is that with blended learning, students can learn through a variety of activities that apply to many different learning styles. I mean, blended learning is important because it breaks down the traditional walls of teaching that don't work for all students, of course. And as I said before, blended learning has also limitations such as technology literacy, which may be a significant barrier for some teachers and also students. Lack of immediate response, that is to say, in face-to-face -face method of teaching, students can get the answer immediately, but this is not the case when it comes to online learning. We can also talk about technological problems that is the, or technical problems, including poor uh, internet connectivity. So to summarize, blended learning has changed the way learning is perceived and delivered. And as any other educational strategy, blended learning has its bright and dark sides because the combination of self-paced education and face-to-face -face education needs actually a lot of efforts, training, motivation, and also electronic equipment. Now I'll give the floor to my classmates to present the second part related to flipped classroom, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lubna. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, dear professors. Good evening, dear colleagues from Applied Language Studies and Research in Higher Education. Good, uh, good evening. I hope you are all doing well. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much, Simuddin. Okay, so uh, shall I start? Okay, so uh, after being introduced, yes, let me just. Thank you very much. You start, Simuddin. Can you see the screen? Yes. Can yeah, you? Okay, thank you. Yes. So after, after being introduced and enlightened about the blended learning uh, with our colleagues uh, uh, Lubna and Iman, uh, let us move on now to the uh, uh, flipped classroom, which is uh, merely uh, a formal and structural type of uh, blended learning. Uh, in this presentation, we are going to discuss the following points. We start by a definition of flipped classroom, uh, then the flipped classroom model of learning and teaching. Uh, after that, we'll talk about some advantages and disadvantages of flipped classroom. And then we'll talk about the prospects of the flipped classroom uh, in Morocco. Uh, before delving into uh, details of the definition of flipped classroom, uh, I find it necessary to talk about uh, the origin of flipped classroom. So, in, uh, the uh, in theoretically speaking, so uh, flipped classroom as an idea started in 1993 with uh, Alison King, uh, who published uh, a book entitled uh, From Sage on the Stage. Uh, to uh, guide on the side, in which she focuses on the idea or the importance of uh, constructing meaning in the class uh, instead of uh, uh, transmission of information. Uh, the same uh, uh, idea was adopted by Eric Mazur, the professor at Harvard University, uh, who published a book in 1997 called peer instruction. Uh, he also focuses on the idea on, uh, of uh, devoting the class time for uh, uh, constructing the uh, meaning instead of uh, delivering lectures. Uh, in more practical terms, in more practical terms, the uh, flipped classroom, as it is named uh, nowadays, uh, is commonly attributed to two high school teachers in uh, Colorado, Jonathan Bergman and uh, Aaron Sams. These uh, two chemistry educators uh, wanted to accommodate the students uh, who missed classes. So uh, in 2007, uh, they used the 
basic uh, uh, video recording software that added voiceover and uh, annotations to uh, PowerPoint uh, slideshow presentations that are, that are accessed through uh, electronic and online media. So uh, they, they provided lectures uh, to students uh, who could not show up in the class by creating videos. This method, uh, at the beginning, we call it a pre broadcasting model in 2007. So uh, the pre in pre broadcasting to address the, the, uh, the concept or the idea of viewing the assigned videos prior to coming to the class and broadcasting to, uh, uh, as an acronym of uh, video uh, podcasting. Uh, after uh, development and uh, providing professional development to other teachers, uh, these two uh, chemistry educators uh, decided to change the name from pre broadcasting model to reverse instruction. The reason behind this change is to address the fear that some teachers expressed with the uh, technology oriented and technology driven name of this approach. Then uh, at, uh, in 2010, uh, an article appeared in uh, the Daily Telegraph attributed the, this uh, concept, the Bergman's and Sam's concept, to uh, a high school teacher also, whose name is Carl Fish. He is from Denver, the capital of Colorado. Uh, uh, this high school teacher also blogged about flipped classroom model, and uh, that's why this, uh, the Telegraph writes about, about him as, as uh, the inventor of this term. Uh, exactly after 2010, this approach of flipped classroom uh, became popular in the United Kingdom and its popularity reached its peak uh, after the publication of a work by, by Bergman, uh, Jonathan and Aaron Sams entitled uh, Flip Your Classroom, Reach Every Student in Every Class every day. Well, this was one of the factors of uh, popularity of this approach. Other factors were the overabundance of internet uh, resources that were available, and also the, uh, the students were, uh, the student inclination and the tendency to use the technology in their daily lives. Uh, well, all these factors contributed uh, or have made of this approach an eye-catching model in uh, teaching and learning practice. Well, this, uh, this is in brief about the flipped classroom, uh, uh, the origin of flipped classroom. So, uh, uh, briefly I can say that uh, Bergman, Jonathan and Aaron Sams are considered to be the pioneers uh, well, uh, the pioneers and the inventors of this uh, approach since they put it into practice in 2007. <coughs> well, uh, let us move on now to talk or to see how was this flipped classroom defined. The flipped classroom was defined as a pedagogical model in which the typical lecture and homework elements of a course are reversed. This means that students are introduced to content at home, then they practice working through this content uh, in the classroom by engaging in activities that requires uh, interaction, discussion, uh, application of knowledge, analysis, or any other activity that uh, promotes learner-centeredness and uh, the idea of uh, constructing meaning by the students themselves. Uh, this is actually the reverse of the, uh, the common uh, 
and the traditional way or practice of introducing uh, new content to students, then assigning homework and projects to be completed independently by students at home. In the same line of thought and thinking, Roel, Reedy, and Shannon 2013 explained that flipped classroom. Uh, sorry, because I cannot see here, I have a problem. Sorry, I have a technical problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, Rua Reedy and Shannon in 2013 explained that flipping a class means utilizing easy to use, readily accessible technology in order to free class time from, uh, from lecture. This simply implies that the basis of flipped classroom is to make use of the available technology to assign instructional content uh, uh, onto, uh, in the form of uh, uh, online videos, uh, PowerPoint presentations, or any other materials available online to be viewed by the student at home, uh, and then to be prepared for interaction in the class and discussion and analysis under the guidance of the teacher. So it means that it does not mean that the teacher role is uh, neglected, but as I have said before, the teacher will act as a guide on the side, that is to say a facilitator of learning. So the technology in Flip's classroom is used as a mechanism through which this approach uh, will, uh, uh, will be implemented. In the same direction of ideas, the uh, guiding principle of the flipped classroom, according to Harriet and Schriller 2013, is that work typically done as homework, like problem solving or essay writing, is better undertaken in class with the guidance of the instructor. So uh, listening to lectures or watching videos is better accomplished at home. Uh, this means, this simply means that the uh, content that is presented in, <coughs> sorry, that is presented in the class is better consumed outside of the class before any interaction with the, the peers or with the instruction, uh, with, with the instructor. <coughs> so uh, in flipped classroom, students are required to watch and read the signed materials that are uploaded online by the teacher at home, and then try to remember and understand as much as possible information about the topic. Uh, in this way, uh, the class uh, time will be devoted to process, uh, practice, uh, analyze, uh, well, and evaluate maybe the knowledge that was demonstrated in the videos or other materials, but under the guidance of and the help of the teacher. <clears throat> so as you may notice, I have mentioned that the student and the learner is supposed <clears throat> in the uh, uh, prior to coming to the class to remember as much information as possible and maybe conduct a short quiz to check his understanding. So we are talking about remembering and understanding, which are two basic or uh, too low or thinking skills, okay? So from here, we can deduce that in flipped classroom, the focus is on the lower or the thinking skills at home, whereas the focus is more on higher or the thinking skills in class, that is to say, uh, uh, applying the knowledge that was, that, that was accumulated at home, uh, analyzing, uh, evaluating, and engaging in the, an open discussion, might be doing a presentation, and uh, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so uh, to, ex to exemplify flipped classroom and to, to make a, a kind of a short uh, comparison between flipped classroom and traditional classroom, 
allow me to give you a simple example. So uh, let's uh, consider uh, let's consider that I am a student in a, uh, well a history class, uh, and this and the teacher is or the lecturer uh, in traditional class is going to give a lecture about the uh, Russian Revolution. So in the class, I will be taking notes and information, uh, uh, basic information about fact and event and information about the Russian Revolution and try to understand also as much as possible. Okay, and perhaps the teacher uh, at the end of the session uh, says, for homework, I want you to talk about uh, how the Russian Revolution could have been avoided. So then, what I was doing in the class, I was taking basic notes and information about, uh, uh, and fact about the Russian Revolution. That is to say, trying to uh, t take uh, information, remember information and understand information, yeah, which are two basic skills. And then when I go off uh, and leave the classroom, I start and, uh, to, to apply uh, and uh, analyze, evaluate the knowledge that I have been given in the class in order to tackle the question uh, that is, uh, how could the Russian Revolution uh, have been avoided? So, uh, which, 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 uh, uh, this question which necessitates uh, application of knowledge, analysis, which are high order thinking skills, okay? So the question that imposes itself here, wouldn't it be better to do the, those uh, lower order thinking skills, that is to say remembering and uh, understanding the instructional content at home, then delve into the analysis and the application of my knowledge in the class where there is high probability that I need assistance from the teacher. So, when uh, the idea that I want to make here is not to be long, that uh, the second choice, the second choice is what flipped classroom called for, is calling for, sorry. So flipped classroom is calling for the idea to uh, assign this instructional content to students uh, at home. Then for example, to read about, uh, uh, to, to watch a video about Russian Revolution, okay? Uh, since the basic idea uh, with which this uh, flipped classroom uh, starts is uh, uh, assigning online videos. This is the basic, the, the first idea that was suggested. So then I watched the video about uh, uh, facts and events and information about the Russian Revolution. Then when I, uh, I, I may do a short test at, at home in which I check my understanding, then will I, when I come to the class, maybe our group will do a presentation and we will have an open discussion. We will apply our knowledge, maybe we work our, in group, and then we'll benefit from each other. Uh, well, this is briefly speaking uh, uh, about uh, the relationship about uh, Bloom's taxonomy and the uh, flipped classroom. So the idea here is then when we, when we change, in flipped classroom, when we, uh, flip, uh, uh, the, uh, when we flip the classroom, we flip the order in which we focus on the thinking skills. So we focus more on higher order thinking skills uh, in the classroom. In terms of learning uh, theories, in terms, in terms of learning theories, Flipped classroom draws on several approaches to learning, namely a transmission and a social constructivist approach. For example, <clears throat> students within the frame or within the approach of flipped classroom are supposed to watch videos, to listen to podcast, uh, to podcast, uh, and to do some short uh, quiz at home to check their understanding. Uh, all this about the, the science topic before coming to, to the class. 
So this learning uh, is very transmission-based. Uh, since there is, there, there is no uh, collaboration or uh, sharing of ideas uh, between students, though in theory it could. <clears throat> but uh, uh, when they come to the class, they use this knowledge uh, in group work or tasks, uh, uh, which allow them to uh, collaborate. Uh, and this is, uh, and this fits more in uh, a social constructivist view of learning. Well, uh, that's all about the uh, flipped classroom and Bloom's taxonomy and the uh, definition of uh, uh, flipped classroom. Uh, I will leave the floor to my colleague Ismail and I will uh, discuss later on the advantages and disadvantages of flipped classroom. Ismail, floor is yours. May. Yes, May. Uh, sorry, what is the technical problem? Uh, first of all, let me uh, express my deep thanks to Professor Farfa Abrahim for having this initiative. So as not to forget Professor Sanslewi and all the other professors who have allowed some of their time to share with us their expertise and experience uh, in relation to issues uh, of applied linguistics. Uh, can you see my screen now? No, not yet. Not yet, this May. We cannot see, please. Can you try? Yes, now it's working. It's working? Yes. yes. All right. So to continue in the same line of thought as my classmate Nasser, we are talking in this uh, presentation about the flipped classroom. So as uh, Iman uh, expressed before me, the flipped classroom is a type of blended learning which uh, combines the best elements of online and face-to-face -face learning. So this is really special about the flipped classroom is that it combines the best elements of online and face-to-face -face learning. It is likely to emerge according to 2008 as the predominant model of the future to become far more common than everyone alone. So the flipped classroom is uh, likely to emerge the most popular model of education in the future. Why is that? Because it offers uh, certain choices, certain options to students that were never possible before. So this offers to students uh, to learn their own needs. Uh, and advantages in favor of the flipped classroom. So, as you know, uh, as you know, in a traditional uh, classroom, uh, learners learn, uh, or it is the traditional learning is governed by one page, space, and uh, the students they have to uh, cope with that pace. Uh, to create problems for those underachievers, for those achievers in the class, because uh, each class is said to be a mixed ability class. What does that suggest? It suggests that uh, each class is composed of students. May, that please, are I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but we cannot hear you very well. I guess it would be better if you can speak slowly so that everyone can follow. Okay, thank you, Iman. Can you see my screen? You're welcome. Please, Iman, can you ask your colleagues to turn down their micros, please? Yes, of course, yes. Please, because I think this is the source of this uh, sound problem. Please. Okay, all right. I'll write, a, write them a message. Okay. 
Can you can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, Bill Hassan, we can hear you. Uh, learners learn uh, or it is a tradition. Yes, we right, can. Right, that in traditional classroom. Of classroom. Your PowerPoint is not shared though. Ismail? Ismail? Can you see my screen? Can you hear me now? No? Yes, we can hear you, Ismail. Go ahead. Share your screen. At teacher state, uh, See. I guess you can just wait for him a little bit because there are some technical issues. Okay, so we can move to, we can give the floor to see Abunjid the Jamie. Yeah? So before. Yes, uh... Before that, if you want, I can talk about the advantages and disadvantages of Fit Classroom. Nas, Nasser? Yes, sir. Yes, you can talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of Fit Classrooms. Yes, okay. One second, I'll share the screen with you. Okay, Thank you very much. Okay, the floor is yours and we will elaborate on that. Uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, we have. Uh, yes. Now we can. All right. Yes. I will. I. I will share my screen right now. Okay. Okay. Yes. Is it Go ahead, please. Yes. Sure. Yes. All right. So I was saying that in a traditional classroom, uh, uh, it is uh, governed by one pace, the teacher's pace. Therefore, the students or the underachievers find it very uh, difficult to cope with that teacher's pace. That's why the, the flipped classroom uh, comes to individualize learning and to personalize uh, learning. What does that suggest? It suggests that students now uh, have the chance to uh, learn at their own pace, uh, to learn individually at home. And that is a very uh, positive point, which was not possible uh, before. So uh, throughout this part of the presentation, I'm going to uh, excavate certain points in uh, the flipped classroom's model of learning and teaching. First of all, I will start with uh, this point by Ogan and Williams, 2015, which states that homework at school and school work at home. What does that mean? It means that the classroom is flipped. May, what you may share the screen, please. Share the screen. 
maybe he cannot do so because of the issues he had with the internet. Okay, I think uh, it's preferable to leave him uh, deliver his presentation. If the screen yes. is not shared, it's not a problem. I think, yes. Professor Rafael, what do you think? If you can share it. We are listening. Yes, that's I great. Uh, All right. The advantages and disadvantages. Okay. One, two, three, four. So if it is yeah. not possible, we can do without it. OK, now it is, uh, I think, uh, shared. If you can do share? it. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so I uh, will uh, tackle these points in this part of the presentation, the homework and the schoolwork. The schoolwork is done at home and the homework is done at school. So, so the traditional classroom is flipped, it is inverted, it is reversed upside down. So what was, tra what, uh, what was traditionally done at school uh, shifts or now is done at home. And what was traditionally done at school, now it is done. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think I have a, a problem of internet connection. Mrs. May, uh, this, Mrs. Yes. May can, you me? can you just deliver your presentation and forget about sharing the screen and it will be great. Okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. So for the teacher's role. Yeah. Take your time. Yeah. Okay, so for the teacher's role, uh, the traditional godly approach to education in which the teacher is uh, an expert uh, on all issues is no longer practicable in the flipped classroom. So as my classmates said before me, uh, the teacher is the guide on the side rather than a sage on, rather than, rather than a sage on the stage. This is a statement of Allison, 1993. So the teacher's role uh, shifted from uh, 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 being knowledgeable, deliverer of information, provider of information to facilitators, uh, guides, mentors, advisors, and so on and so forth. Uh, the next point, uh, here I have a statement by uh, Bergman and Sams 2012, who are the initiators of the flipped classroom, as my classmate uh, said before me in 2012, in 2007. By implementing a flipped classroom, the lecturer no longer must lecture for two hours while the students take notes. They can fully utilize in-class time for discussion and problem solving with uh, students. This idea suggests that the class time uh, is much more important to be wasted in just uh, lower order thinking skills, that the class time is valuable and it should be exploited. It should be uh, invested in high order thinking skills. I mean, developing critical thinking skills as we are going to see uh, later on uh, with the Bloom's taxonomy. Can you see now this, can you see this slide? You forget yes. it, Mary. I think, yes. because Mary. We you, you share, forget about the slides. Yeah, when you share the slides, the uh, internet connection is weaker. So please, yeah. deliver. we listen to you, we understand you. It's okay. Okay, Sismay? Okay, thank you, Professor. For the okay. student's role, in class, the students engage in processing activities, concluding with productive feedback. So now the students are uh, active learners in the classroom rather than passive learners. They come to the class to engage in interactional activities. And this is what is uh, very important in the flipped uh, classroom, uh, uh, not, not like the traditional uh, classroom. I have here a statement by uh, Brame, 2013. He says, in class, students engage in processing activities, concluding with productive feedback. So here, the key terms is uh, processing activities which uh, suggests 
that the information is no longer a problem. The students are exposed to the information outside the classroom. They can listen to audios, they can watch videos, they can read PDFs, they can read materials. When they come to class, another story begins. What is the story of the class? Uh, the story is that the students have to process that information. They have to develop uh, critical thinking skills through discussions, debates, uh, interactional activity in a nut uh, shell. Uh, for active learning, passive learning, active learning includes activities, discussions, student created content, independent problem solving, inquiry based learning, and project based learning. This is according to Bergman, Overmeyer, and Willy 2012. So the activities in which the students uh, are engaged in the classroom include. Uh, this type of activities, discussions, students created content after being exposed to uh, the information at home. Uh, the last point I will deal with here is Bloom's taxonomy in the flipped classroom. This is an idea that my classmate dealt with, but I will deal with it here in a different way. What does that mean? The flipped classroom and Bloom's taxonomy. Students are doing the lower level of cognitive work, gaining knowledge and comprehension outside of class, and focusing on the higher forms of cognitive uh, assignment in class. So in traditional classroom, the students come to class uh, with uh, zero knowledge about the, the content. That's why they have to listen to the teacher and take notes. Now, in the flipped classroom, the students do not come to the class with zero knowledge, but they rather come to the class with some knowledge about the content. Uh, so they have to start a new journey. It is the journey of processing information, the journey of uh, uh, getting involved into uh, debates and discussions, which helps them as learners. And this uh, matches uh, the learning theories, or this is well grounded in the learning theories of constructivism and socio-constructivism, as my classmates explained before me. Uh, the constructivism uh, advocates learner-centered approach. The constructivism uh, highlights the idea that learners should construct knowledge. They are active constructors of knowledge rather than a passive uh, recipient of uh, external stimuli. Uh, Vygotsky uh, in, encouraged group work and advised uh, teachers to, uh, to practice or to adopt group work and pair work in the class. Why? Because students uh, learn from each other, because it is through group work and uh, pair work the students reach a high level of uh, understanding. Okay, I give the floor now to my classmate to talk to us about the advantages and the disadvantages of the flipped classroom. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Smail. Can you just switch the sharing screen uh, so I can uh, share my screen? Can you see the screen, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can see it well. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So, uh, as far as advantages and disadvantages of uh, Philippe's classroom uh, are concerned, uh, sorry, as far as Philippe's classroom, uh, 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 advantages and disadvantages of Philippe's classroom are concerned, uh, one of the advantages of uh, Flip's classroom is that it allows a student to move at uh, their own pace. Uh, this uh, means that in a classroom, uh, as you may all know, uh, one common practice of uh, teachers is that they try to uh, pace their instructions on, on the basis of uh, uh, their student needs. Uh, because if they go fast, many students will be left behind. And uh, if they go slowly, uh, then uh, many students will feel bored. Uh, 
So uh, by uh, allowing or by moving the instructional content out of the class into uh, online videos, uh, students uh, will have uh, control uh, over the instructional content uh, and they can pause and rewind as many times as possible. The, in addition to this, uh, Flips Classroom promotes uh, student-centered learning and uh, collaboration. So, in what sense? Uh, in Flips Classroom, uh, students can master uh, some skills through uh, collaborative projects and uh, discussion. This encourages students to teach and learn uh, concepts from their uh, uh, peers. Uh, of course, under the guidance of the uh, teacher. Uh, also, by allowing students to partake uh, in their uh, learning, they uh, will own the knowledge they achieve. And uh, this, in turn, will build a kind of self-confidence. Uh, another point uh, about the advantages is that in the flipped classroom, it is easier for the teacher to customize and update the curriculum. Uh, how that can happen? As you know, and according to what we have discussed uh, before, if lift class lectures, or at least theoretically, uh, so he has, uh, he has enough time to uh, have one-on-one -on -one interaction with students and this will pave the way, will pave the way to, see, to the teacher to identify and single out the individual needs of each uh, learner by identifying these individual uh, uh, needs the teacher can devise a customized lesson plan that uh, exceeds and uh, goes uh, beyond the limitations of the official uh, curriculum in order to meet those individual needs. <clears throat> uh, furthermore, another uh, advantage about the flipped classroom is that the use of technology in flipped classroom is more appropriate to the 21st century students. As it is well now, the 21st century students they use technology on their daily basis or they are acquainted with technology from their starting from their childhood they are considered to be digital natives since they speak the digital language so by <clears throat> integrating the technology uh, in their learning more engaged and motivated also, the uh, flipped classroom promotes independent learning. In flipped classroom, students acquire uh, the habits of uh, learning uh, at home uh, on their own, and this will uh, make them more self-reliant. Instead of being uh, spoon-fed by uh, the instructors in the class. Well, uh, there are other advantages, uh, but I'll move, uh, for the moment, I will move for disadvantages of flipped classroom. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that the put, there is a potential for misuse or misapplication by the teacher. How? Uh, some teachers, uh, well, they understand flipped classroom as moving out the instructional content uh, uh, from the classroom to uh, the outside of the classroom to students' homes. So then, the, uh, without utilizing the, uh, the time that is left in the classroom, or at least without properly utilizing uh, the class time to develop the higher order thinking skills. Uh, also, there is a potential misapplication by the teacher. Uh, this uh, implies that some teachers may select or 
uh, create videos that's not that that are not appropriate in terms of the length or the, uh, the difficulty the degree of the difficulty or uh, the quality of the uh, the uh, the contents uh, another disadvantage of this classroom is uh, uh, related to students some students uh, do not do their uh, pre-class assignments and this is another issue uh, and uh, another disadvantage is uncertainty about the impact of increased screen time on students well uh, if uh, the idea or the driver behind flipped classroom uh, be, uh, behind, behind adopting flipped classroom is to assign the instructional content uh, in the form of online videos or online materials to students to be uh, uh, so as to consult this content at home imagine if four or five subjects do uh, or flip uh, also their classrooms so they will be uh, uh, well, a considerable amount of time uh, spent uh, behind or in front of the screen, uh, which may cause uh, a lack of concentration or overload of information, and sometimes distractions. Students can well seize the occasion and well divert from the uh, the the main objective and. Uh, uh, might be uh, <clears throat> consult uh, social media. Uh, another uh, disadvantage is the user resistance. Uh, for example, uh, some teachers who have spent decades teaching and using the traditional methods find it difficult to change or they resist, resist the change uh, for different reasons, might be because they are not well trained, trained to use the technology, and sometimes uh, the teachers they are about to retire and they just say, "Okay, there is no need to uh, well to do this change." The last but not the least uh, advantage is that students do not have equal access to internet no technological or no technological devices. Uh, this is about, the, uh, is about the digital divide among students. Uh, well, not all the students have equal access to the internet, and also, uh, especially in rural areas, uh, uh, students might not have uh, even laptops or any technological device. Well, uh, thank you very much. I will leave the floor now for uh, my colleague Ismail to tackle the last part of this presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nasser, for your illustrative uh, explanation. Uh, we'll try to share the screen in case it works. Is it shared, not yet? Yes, it is shared. It no. is? You no, cannot sure. see. Sure. Hmm? Sure. Okay. So this uh, part of the presentation aims at exploring the previous research that is conducted in Morocco about the flipped classroom. Uh, the aim of this part is to explore, to investigate, where to investigate uh, what has been conducted uh, in Morocco about the flipped classroom. So I have here two studies. The first one is conducted by Jafari, 2019, from Qadi Ayad University, Morocco, entitled, his study is entitled flipped learning for repurposing EFL class time in Moroccan University. And of course, uh, without going into details, I'm going to tackle only the implications of the study. So uh, Jafari, who is a professor at the Faculty of Arabic in Marrakesh, conducted a study on 60 
students in Marrakesh. He has experienced the flipped classroom on his with his students, and of course, his study yields uh, some uh, conclusions, some uh, results, which I would like to share with you. So, uh, the, the analysis conducted on the basis of the results from the performance of the students demonstrates that flipped learning pedagogy has driven the students towards high performance. So, uh, Jafari uh, uh, suggests or Jafari uh, asserts that the flipped classroom has driven the students towards uh, high performance. Uh, why is that? Because it has enabled the low achievers to view the content at home and to master the content. Therefore, uh, they got uh, good grades in the exam. For the second uh, point or the second implication, the underachievers benefit from the possibility of viewing and reviewing the content at home to maximize their engagement and the degree of input. So as Nasser said, and as I said before, the flipped classroom helps uh, the underachievers to learn at their pace and to uh, maximize their learning opportunities because they can no longer uh, follow the teacher's pace, but they can learn in, uh, at, at their individual paces. For the third uh, point that is included in that study, high achieving students in their turn enhance and demonstrate their proficiency level in several occasions, namely online quiz, class debate, and final paper exam. So the flipped classroom uh, did not only help the low achievers, but it also helped the uh, high achievers to demonstrate high levels of thinking and to develop uh, good uh, think critical thinking uh, skills. The second study is conducted by Ait Musa, who is a professor uh, from Mohammed I University in Wujda, Morocco. The study is entitled An Experience in Moroccan University Using Flipped Classroom Method. Uh, this study focuses on the use of new technologies in the implementation of an inverted classroom pedagogy at the University of Ujda in Morocco for students enrolled in a course of technology of web of the Faculty of Science. So no harm in that because uh, Sams and Bergman, they were chemistry teachers in Colorado in the United States and the flipped classroom started uh, in scientific, with scientific uh, disciplines or subjects. So for the implications of this study, uh, first, the study shows in particular that the flipped classroom method is more beneficial for students with academic difficulties. So again, it's uh, the same uh, implication that is reiterated in the first study. So it helps, the flipped classroom helps uh, students with academic difficulties since the, their results show that they succeed better in the work put online. The second implication is that the flipped classroom method also benefits good students who can develop high level skills. Just like the first study, uh, Ait Musa 2017 asserts that the flipped classroom helps also the high achievers to uh, demonstrate high level thinking skills. Uh, I cannot uh, share the screen to show you the references we worked on to prepare this presentation, but no harm, I will share with you the presentation later on. Thank you very much for listening. Your questions, your queries, and your comments are wholeheartedly welcome. Thank you. I will share them, Smail. Thank you, Smail. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So first, I would like to congratulate uh, you, dear students, Lubna, Iman, Nasser, and uh, Smail, for the great job you have done and the great efforts that you have invested in the preparation and delivery of uh, your presentations. Okay, sorry, this Before is even, you are Lubna, Iman, Nasser, and Smail, yes? 
Yes, yes, yes professor. professor. Okay. Because we have two imen, uh, two imens in this room. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would like to clarify just some points before giving the floor to my uh, friend and uh, colleague, C. Smail. Number one. Flipped classrooms and uh, blended learning is used in formal education, that is formal learning, and non-formal learning, and informal learning. And this is one of the advantages of e-learning in general, distance education, online learning, different names, inverted classrooms, flipped classrooms, they are used interchangeably. They have come to, in case they are appropriately used, to bridge a number of gaps. Gaps, the wide and the deep gaps between formal, non-formal, informal learning. The second gap, Gender gaps, okay? Gaps, geographical gaps, if they are appropriately used. Gaps between education and education institutions and their socioeconomic sector. This is one. The second, the human, okay? The human. What do we have in e-learning, e-education? Either education, the uh, traditional term used, and the shift to learning, we have human beings, okay? We are teachers, are human beings, and learners are also human beings. They should be considered as full human beings, particularly learners, okay? Full human beings have, they have some needs which should be met. We start with teachers. Teachers have some needs. They need a pre-service, in-service, professional development to become lifelong learners and teachers okay they need they have some needs learners what are learners needs they have psychological social cultural cognitive etc needs but more importantly they have learning needs that is the learning pedagogies, the learning environments, spaces uh, should be met. What is more important is that learner, learners' needs are not the same. Learners' needs are diverse. They have different needs. And those needs are not stagnant. They are ever changing. If you remember, uh, some uh, scholars agree that there are no two classes the same, which means learning environments, learning contexts, learning spaces, learners in terms of their present and future needs, and what happens in those spaces and contexts are different and ever changing, okay? So no one, no one in the field of education uh, says that e-learning, that these gadgets, website learning, uh, learning can replace teachers, okay? or can turn learners into uh, robots or into uh, gadgets, okay? That we can inject with some knowledge. No one can say this, 
okay? No one. The three lectures, previous or four previous lectures, have focused on humans. The problem is, how shall we, or what we sh should we do to enhance, okay, to enhance the performance, competencies, capacities of these human beings through and within the educational process to enhance the quality of teaching, the quality of learning, and the quality of achievement, performance, and success. This is the question. When it comes to technology, okay, which is also ever changing, the question is, how can we use technologies to enhance learning, to meet diverse needs of diverse learners, present and future. How to help learners maintain uh, themselves and teachers as well as lifelong learners. So these are the, the, the most important questions Given the context, the, either the, when talking about the traditional context, the traditional context is not traditional because it is not online, or it is not flipped, or it is not blended, or it is not. No. It is traditional because it was not considered as a social context, as a small society, as a community of learning because it was governed by theories of education, theories of learning, which do not recognize learners as full human beings, which perceive the roles of learners as being passive and recipients of knowledge, and of course, these perceptions are based, once again, I repeat, on behaviorism. And the principles of behaviorism, supported by positivism, students and human beings, citizens, I repeat, citizens, behaviorism and positivism were not only theories of educational language acquisition, okay? They are theories introduced and they were dominant to explain human behavior, either in, the, in different contexts, in the field of economy, politics, in the field of education, and elsewhere. How to control, to understand the variables and to control change, which is no longer the case. And since one of the presenters, uh, mentioned transmission-based, please don't confuse. Transmission-based theories in the field of education and mass media and communication theory and constructivism. Transmission-based theories were dominant, thanks once again to behaviorism and positivism, in the field of media, in the field of communication theory. Transmission theories were introduced in the departments of physics, not in the department of education. In 1949, in 1949, in the department of physics and mathematics, by Weaver, okay? Two, and they had far-reaching implications in different fields, including education. Transmission theories held that during the Cold War, we can, we can inject through media the public opinion. The public opinion. It depends. So the, uh, the transmitter, the, 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 the source of information is very important. In the field of politics and Cold War, it was politicians. In classroom, it is the teacher. Elsewhere, the father, 
maybe the uh, eldest brother, it depends. So please make necessary connections that we can inject the public opinion. We can inject children at home. We can inject, okay, we can inject um, uh, students with what is wrong and what we think is correct. We inject them with pieces of information. No reaction, no feedback. We create, uh, we create uh, uh, human beings regardless of the, but deep changes happened. So now we're talking with Lincoln, for example, uh, yes, uh, uh, presenters have been talking about learner centeredness. And we will talk about learner centeredness and constructivism. This a learning can serve the, it is, it depends on how we use it to enhance learning. So, um, a learning is, is, uh, and the blended learning and flipped classrooms are merely practical implications. They are not principles. They don't define, okay, the ideas and the principles and assumptions, the goals, the ideals of education, but they have come to help to enhance the achievement of the goals, which have come to be, fortunately, learner-centered in nature. They go beyond formal education because some of the purposes are to prepare youth and children for the future, to be active citizens. Why education by the end? Is it to have good maps? No. The ultimate purpose to have to, pro, uh, to prepare people for the future. The future, which is characterized by challenges we don't know about. So we prepare students for the unknown, things we don't know. So here we cannot tell them exactly what would become truth in the future, but just to uh, instill in them uh, some sort of critical thinking, creativity, and the abilities to cope with change, with choices, with crisis, with, 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 with okay? To hopefully uh, equip them with enough competencies, skills, and values, okay? To cope with the future challenges. Another point, yes, constructive and social and cultural theories. For social and cultural, because sometimes it happens, yes, that this is a new culture, sometimes it is not mine, sometimes please. I would like to ask you, how much time do our children, our students, and do we spend online? On online spaces, different spaces, okay? They are different, okay? So new way, another space, another context, new way of life. What about life on the online, uh, the nature of life online? Our life in those contexts, isn't that a new culture? Not a new culture, but some ingredients that have come to, okay? That have come to, okay? to define one's life. Another example before the emergence of e-learning. Someone who uh, lived for 20 years in a locality, someone somewhere in the north of Morocco, the east or the west or the south of Morocco. And it happens that he moved to Casablanca, where he has never been. Is, this is a new culture, new ways of life that one has to adapt, to which one has to adapt and adopt. This is the case. No one, please, says that teachers can be replaced, okay? The job of teachers 
has not become easier. The job of teachers has become more complicated, more difficult, more challenging, and ever changing. This is why some of us may seem to be resistant. Why resistant? Because they have found themselves um, sadly outside the comfort zones. Teachers were happy. They had their courses. And all they had to do, or they had to do, to get up early, to be on time or in time, to deliver uh, the knowledge the, they are the, uh, of which they are the only owners, they are happy. Okay? But this changes, and by the way, change brings with it fear, anxiety, losers and winners, new challenges, and by the end, we are human beings. So we need trainings. The problem is the extent to which both teachers and students are open to change. That is, they are open to change themselves and to change others. Whether they are ready to, uh, ready to change or whether their uh, ideological, intellectual, since we are working in the field of education, we have to uh, put things in this context. Their ideological, this intellectual, okay? I'm not talking about the big ideologies, but each one has his own or her own ideology. Whether it is more or less consistent with change or with the ever-changing challenges, if um, teachers and students already have some flexible frames of reference, they can adapt, they can try, they are ready to learn, they are motivated. And people who are not motivated, either students or teachers, cannot do great jobs. They cannot excel. The performance will never be that high quality, will not be inspiring if your intellectual your perception and beliefs of what education is or should be, what kind of relationship that should exist between one and his or her students and children. Okay? If it is contrary to the uh, changes characterizing and defining our times and will define the future, then we cannot expect good results. But through training and training and training and group work between and the great work between colleagues and this kind of work, yeah, we can. We can uh, 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 overcome. Okay? So remember that the role of teachers hasn't become easy. No, it, is, uh, it has become an aching job. Okay? So because it requires this openness on change and ever-changing uh, uh, challenges. I don't want to talk about learner-centeredness because we have learner-centeredness. Why my colleagues, during the last four seminars and today, they focus on, they focus on the pedagogical aspect of e-learning, distance learning, blended, and why? They know why. Because pedagogies are based on some assumptions of what education is, or at least what it should be. What kind of relationship should exist between education institutions and society, between teachers and learners? What are the goals, the ultimate? Sometimes people do not agree on the goals of education the, and education institutions, the, miss, the missions, the strategies, and the values of uh, education. 
Okay, so um, thank you very much. I, 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 want to, uh, I want you to make these connections because things are not, uh, for a better, uh, better understanding of practical everyday uh, problems and the complexities that we are facing, this we can uh, uh, find solutions for giving the willingness, the willingness of policy makers. Here our job is to, uh, in applied linguistics, is to join those efforts being done and to uh, come out with some conclusions, with some recommendations, which may hopefully help decision makers. Some issues that we are discussing, technicalities, this is uh, problems of uh, connection and uh, social justice and social equity. I know that now there are people who are uh, in some look localities somewhere in Morocco. They don't have an uh, internet connection. They don't have a, uh, and the quality by the, by, by, do we have the same iPhones and mobiles? No, we don't have the same. Okay, because it depends on our ability to buy that or this. Institutions haven't, haven't equipped students and teachers, even teachers, with high quality uh, iPhones. So these are issues which are institutional in nature and they are also related to policy making that we can discuss. And I will discuss because I have a presentation. The last presentation, the last seminar is on applied linguistics or and politics. Applied linguistics as the interface between policy makers and decision makers and pedagogical practice, including teachers training. And we will address this, uh, this, uh, these issues, inshallah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now uh, I would like to give the floor unless uh, uh, okay, so uh, by the end we will have a discussion, and uh, my colleagues and students can uh, okay can contribute and uh, critiques and criticize and add remarks, ask questions, raise new issues. Okay, uh, we are here to learn from each other. Now I give the floor to my friend, uh, my colleague, our wonderful uh, guest, Si Abdulmajid Jami. And this is why the Abdulmajid Jabri will talk, will address some issues which are educational, educational issues, because we are humans, okay? Simply because we are humans. Students are human beings and they should be treated as such. And we are human beings. This is why each time we discuss uh, these uh, issues related to technology use, we end with with uh, some issues which are human, educational, pedagogical in nature. Si Abdelmajid uh, Jami, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Professor Al Karfa. So let me say a word first in Arabic. Awan atakadam bi shukr wa awan rahib bi Sayyid Al Amil, Ustad Al Muhtaram Khalid Al Zahar, and Ustad Azal Arab Al Hakim Bin Nani, and Jamia Al Zumala, and Jamia Jamiat Sayyid Muhammad Bin Abdullah Bi Fas. كما أشكر سيد الرئيس الجامعة الحسن لور بيستات الأستاذ داخل الجصافي والأستاذ المحترم أديب جنان والأستاذ أحمد فال مركزي وكذلك كل أساتذة جامعة الحسن لور بيستات وخصوصا الزملاء والزميلات بكلية اللغات والفنون والعلوم الإنسانية والمدرسة العليا للتربية والتكوين Now uh, I switch to English I would like to thank Professor Karfaf who has made it possible for us to meet again in this uh, academic event I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Sandy, Professor Slawi, Professor Bevni, Professor Medani, Professor Bakali, of course, the list is very long, Professor Benis, Professor Mubtasim, and Professor Bulfaqir, Professor Tayyip Gordo, and uh, Professor Nasiri. 
and I'm sorry if I if I forget anyone. So, uh, but I would like uh, to warmly uh, thank students of the master program for their efforts and patience, and special thanks to Sir Miki uh, Amiri for his uh, uh, efforts. Uh, then I would like to congratulate uh, uh, the speakers, master students, Lubna Bouazzi, Inna Al Qalay. Uh, uh, Sir Ismail Bil Hassan and uh, Sinasar on their great uh, job. Okay, so uh, my presentation today, I will start, you know, from uh, what uh, Professor Qarfa has uh, finished. Uh, let me just, you know, can you can you see the screen? Yes, Professor. You see. Yes, it's clear. Yeah, that's okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, my uh, presentation today, it will be uh, about uh, the human side of uh, technology that is uh, uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes okay, Professor. So Yes. Yeah, so the outline of my presentation will be as follows. Uh, I'll share with you background of uh, uh, social presence theory, uh, a definition, then uh, uh, measuring or how to measure uh, social presence, the categories of uh, social presence and uh, its dimensions, and how to maintain and establish uh, social presence in virtual learning communities, then the netiquettes in virtual learning communities, and the 10 rules within uh, these communities. As an introduction to this uh, presentation, the purposeful building of a supportive learning community requires social presence, which paves the way for communication within a trusted environment where students can express individual identities and establish social relationship. Uh, this uh, uh, conveys that the community of uh, inquiry uh, prepares grounds for being an effective and trusted communicator and learner. Uh, uh, it is, again, also uh, important that we understand, as uh, Professor al Qafa said before, how students and teachers socially, int uh, socially interact in online courses where uh, asynchronous computer media communication, or ACMC, is the major form of this course. So uh, in this case, the theory of social presence helps everyone, which means every pra practitioner in the educational field, uh, to explain how students and teachers interact and learn online. Uh, as a background of uh, social presence, let's uh, uh, focus on three phases of uh, uh, this theory, especially when it comes to research. So the first phase, uh, uh, it is, uh, it started, you know, or it, uh, it took place, you know, in the 1970s, which means that in the first phase, Short, Williams, and Christie, 1976, developed the theory of uh, social presence to explain the effects a communication medium can have, uh, of course, on the way people communicate. Uh, these uh, scholars conceptualized social presence as a critical attribute of uh, a communication medium, which can determine, of course, the way people interact and communicate. The same scholars, which means uh, Shorts and others, also posited that people perceive some communication media as having a higher degree of social presence, example, uh, for example, when it comes to videos, than other communication media when it comes to audio. So which means social presence, it could be high or higher, or it could be low or lower. So it depends. It depends on the medium used, as Professor al Qarfa uh, said. So uh, the second phase in the late 1980s and early 19, uh, uh, 90s, of course, as the popularity of CMC grow, communication researchers began to apply the theory of uh, social presence, 
developed by these scholars, as I said before, to CMC. So which means CMC and social present, they are uh, in complementary distribution. One complements the other. One prepares ground for the other. So many of these early researchers, of course, came to uh, 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 the conclusion that CMC was antisocial and impersonal. What does uh, this mean? Which means the machine or the computer, because whenever we say computer mediated communication, so the computer here, it's not the laptop, it's not this desktop, but any medium used to communicate, to share, etc. So first of all, they were seen as impersonal, anti-social. Why? Because they excluded, at that time of course, the use of uh, 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 verbal cues or non-verbal cues. I'm talking about gestures, facial expressions. They, they were excluded. Why? Simply because the social context cues were filtered out at the time. Uh, in the early and mid 1990s till now, researchers with experience using CMC for educational purposes begin to question whether the attributes of uh, a communication medium determine its social presence. So in this phase, which means the third one, it has been argued that uh, uh, a user's uh, personal perceptions, which means how social presence was uh, or is uh, perceived, what has been perceived from the past till now, matter uh, more than uh, the medium's uh, capabilities. As the uh, professor has just said, so we have different mobile phones and smartphones, etc., which makes what? Which makes CMC social and uh, personal. Uh, as a definition of uh, social presence, uh, uh, believe me that I uh, find it hard to select one uh, definition that corresponds to uh, social presence, but I have uh, suggested four, and let's uh, focus on the key words, on the key terms in each uh, definition, and let's uh, critique and let's compare between these uh, 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 definitions. So the first one, uh, define social presence as the degree to which people are perceived as uh, real in CMC. So whenever we speak about the degree of being real, of course, we speak about face-to-face. -face. But now we speak about e-learning, the use of the medium. So to what extent we consider people with whom we are, so either communicating, online, uh, chatting, sharing, teaching, learning from, as a real, as in face-to-face. -face. This is one. The second definition, that of uh, Garrison and others, 2000, brings something that is a little bit different from the first definition, in which uh, social presence is defined as the ability of uh, students to project themselves socially and emotionally as a real people. So whenever we speak about a learning group, a learning community, so are students able to communicate socially and emotionally? The third one, define uh, uh, or define social presence as the degree of uh, feeling, perception, and the reaction of being connected by CMC to another person. And the last one, define social presence as uh, students' perceptions of uh, being in and belonging to an online course. It depends on each one of us. So either we perceive CMC and social presence in the same way, or we have different views. So, uh, uh, you know, let me, you know, summarize, you know, these uh, definitions. So, as you can see in this uh, slide, nearly everyone, every scholar uh, who writes about social presence continues to define it just a little differently. Therefore, making it very difficult for both researchers and practitioners 
to come to any firm conclusions about the nature of the social presence, simply because we are dealing with human or human beings. Uh, now, how uh, social presence can be measured? Just as uh, social presence is uh, difficult to define, as I said first, in the first beginning, it is even harder to measure uh, uh, social presence or this uh, construct or variable. Of course, there is uh, uh, little agreement on how to measure social presence in the sense that very few researchers have operationalized social presence into observable and me measurable parts. And here are the, the, the examples of these uh, 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 ways of measuring social presence. So the first one, the focus was uh, primarily on surveying and interviewing students about their perceptions of the CMC and social presence. So which means researchers uh, uh, put a framework for uh, uh, students to give their opinions. How do they perceive social presence and CMC? How when we say CMC and social presence, how do they perceive the use of the medium and how they perceive themselves while using the medium and the degree of being socially present with others in a learning community, in a virtual learning community, exactly. So the second way of measuring social presence focused on identifying observable behaviors, as we say, human, the human side, used by students to project themselves as a real people. So we need to measure how students act and react within virtual learning communities. So the last way, the last uh, strategy, so because of differences like these, Rousseau and Benson, 2005, argue that there is a need for multi-method approach and instrument to measure social presence. We don't need only one method, but we speak sometimes about uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, approaches, mixed method, etc. For the categories of uh, social presence, they can be limited uh, uh, in five. The first one, it is the affective association. What does uh, this mean? This, of course, includes uh, the way students or the teacher, for example, can express themselves online. For example, how they can express their emotions. The students and teachers express their emotions online. Uh, when we say online, which means in, in a virtual learning community. And whenever we speak about community, we have to make a difference between a group and a community. Because the community or people who belong to a community, they share many things in common and they have a goal. For example, if you have a Facebook group or a WhatsApp group of uh, 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 students, they share the same interest and they have the same goal. It is to construct, as uh, our colleagues uh, said before, their own learning. Uh, in addition to uh, expressing themselves, their emotions, they can use humor. It's more effective. Or they can self-disclose. And of course, I, I spoke last time about uh, self-disclosure in uh, uh, CMC. The second category is a community cohesive or cohesion that is characterized by the use of the vocatives. And uh, it also addresses or refers to the group using inclusive pronouns. In, I say inclusive pronouns. For example, do we. So within a community, there must be a cohesion which means that no student, let me just, you know, like uh, declaring a hypothesis, no student is allowed to say I 
but we have to say the we. So the I melts within the community. Number three, let's talk about the uh, instructor involvement, which means uh, what is the extent to which the instructor is involved? Of course, it is uh, uh, very interesting to speak about this issue. Why? Simply because they have to push their students to engage in critical analyses and to think in the online environment. And then we can speak about uh, critical thinking, of course, to analyze and so on. The fourth category, or the, 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 the fourth uh, uh, you know, aspect that char characterizes uh, the social presence model is uh, interaction strength, in which uh, learners quote from other messages and they refer explicitly, explicitly to other messages. They may ask questions, they give feedback, asking for help, and this may happen you know, frequently uh, with students or teachers when they, when they go online. Uh, uh, asking for help, as I said, complimenting, expressing appreciation, and expressing their agreement, etc. And this shows strongly many characteristics of being socially present online. The fifth and the last uh, category of uh, social presence is interaction intensity. Or, uh, 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 I'm sorry, because I spoke before about that. Let's speak about the knowledge and experience. Knowledge and experiences play an essential role a role in building social presence. Uh, in this case, students and teachers, they may from time to time share their experiences because sometimes they may inspire. Uh, for some teachers, it seems to be that this is uh, uh, the margin, but sometimes the margin is very interesting or is more interesting than the center simply because or I, let me give you a very si simple example. When a student, uh, so uh, take uh, uh, primary school as uh, examples. Uh, this is of course uh, uh, in face-to-face -face, uh, classroom. When a student receives uh, his paper, for example, of the exam, and the teacher gives a mark. So where normally or generally teachers put marks, it is in the margin. So the student, in this case, focuses on the margin more than the center. That's why the margin sometimes must be given more importance or much importance than uh, uh, the center. I am not the deconstructing the place or the position of uh, uh, the teacher, but the teacher is always there. Uh, for the dimensions of uh, social presence, they can be summarized into intimacy and immediacy. So in brief, intimacy has to do with the physical distance. It is uh, to, be, uh, to be physically distant from each other. So either among students, learners, or the teacher and the students, etc. But immediacy it has to do with the psychological distance. So to what extent uh, uh, teachers or the teacher and the students are close to each other. Are they close to each other or they are far from each other? In a different way, I can say that uh, social presence is the degree of uh, one person or one person's perception of uh, realism the extent to which the other person is perceived as real. I'm talking about the users of uh, the machine. When he is or she is involved in no matter what kind of uh, 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 the medium is, any medium, any medium should uh, 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 perform these uh, tasks of uh, intimacy and uh, immediacy. 
now something which is very interesting, which has to do with the pedagogy and the classroom, etc. I'm talking about online classroom. How can we establish and maintain social presence? Of course, I have to, to mention three uh, elements, the course uh, design, the instructors, and the participants who are uh, very often the, the learners. So to develop or to speak about the course design in social presence, we have to mention how to develop welcome or welcoming messages, how to welcome others online. This is uh, as uh, uh, many, uh, uh, many colleagues uh, mentioned the human side of technology. Man, as Professor Sandy said before, humanware, as Professor Sa uh, Bouzien said before, and how to include students' profiles, because they are very interesting in design a course online. So who are the students that I have in my classes online? And how to incorporate audio or video? How to limit the class size? Because uh, this is uh, a challenge nowadays in the Moroccan uh, uh, higher education. It is the size, the big number of students that we need, for example, especially uh, for the open access uh, faculties and institutions. Can we divide those uh, big numbers into small classes online? Or there are other ways. But anyway, before designing a course, we have to think of the class size, which is very interesting. To structure collaborative learning activities, to prepare activities that enhance collaborative learning. But when it comes to instructors, there must be a contribution to discussion boards. Now we raise the question, do teachers discuss with their peers, with their, sorry, with their students, with their learners in the group, or they ignore what is being there, what is shared by students. Also to answer emails. And of course, whenever we speak about the email, it is asynchronous. There is flexibility in time and place. And to provide frequent feedback, and whenever we speak about the feedback, it is very interesting to develop uh, the learners' capacities and to move you know, from one piece of information to another. It's like the hypothesis of uh, the I plus one. Strike up a conversation and to share personal stories and experiences, as I said before. They may inspire the learner Though we need some studies from both sides, because to share your secrets sometimes in learning groups, some people may consider, I am, I am not attacking anyone, but I am putting things as they are. Some people may think that the teacher is losing the learner's time, or the teacher doesn't want to share his secrets with learners. And they, uh, and they say no, because learners are part of us. To use humor from time to time. And to use uh, emoticons, which means to express his or her emotions online to his students. Now, we can do some research, do our practices, do our colleagues use humor in the classroom. Uh, do they reduce the effect and the stress students are uh, 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 experiencing? So either coming and going means of uh, transportation, the quality of life, etc. And what about expressing emotions? Are we allowed to express our emotions to our learners? Or it's uh, illegal? 
We don't know. We need research. From the side of the participants, of course, they are expected to contribute to discussion pools. They have to be, uh, uh, as your you know, friend said before, active participants and not passive. And there we can speak about uh, constructing meaning, constructing their own learning, knowledge, etc. They have to contribute to answer email, uh, of course, at the same time, which is shared between professors and uh, uh, participants. Strike up a conversation to share their stories and their experiences because they may help their friends overcome many obstacles of life experiences and challenges. Of course, they are allowed to use humor to express their emotions and to use appropriate titles because uh, uh, this is uh, of course needed especially because I forget a point there which is very interesting. The teacher should also call students by their names. No longer to say, hey, you or he or she. No, we need to give value to our students, especially online. So we need you know, some research to know whether students are satisfied when they are called by their names, real names or not. So uh, in the same context, let me share with you some uh, uh, netiquettes that I have uh, uh, published an article about. In this sense, I have uh, shared with the Silmiki the article, you know, to share it with the master students and colleagues, etc. So she introduced the netiquette as uh, to make yourself look good online. Of course, you know, it's not easy to look good online, to know what you are talking about and make sense. to respect but when we go online which means we transmit we transfer you know our face-to-face -face education to online we have of course to respect the netiquettes so as to compare between uh, the rules and the norms in face-to-face -face and online for wood and smith they state that virtual communities establish rules that they expect their members to observe. Any member of the rules governing accepted behavior has been codified as internet etiquette or uh, netiquette. Let me come back you know, to the first definition. According to she, 1994, uh, uh, the netiquette has to do with the user's reputation online. And of course, uh, uh, Imens Lamy last time, you know, asked me about the identity of uh, the learner or the teacher uh, online. Of course, we speak about the reputation, our reputation online. So what does this mean? This means that having uh, a very good image is basically uh, dependent on the meaning uh, of uh, what you discuss. So, which means your information should be meaningful, which makes the netiquette as a boycott with the misbehaving in a virtual community. In this sense, we need more studies again because my aim is to raise issues for research. We need to compare. So do we need you know, to respect these uh, rules and norms uh, in face-to-face -face or online? We need a comparison. We need more studies in the Moroccan context. As if 
reality with its social backgrounds would be reflected on the web. Uh, uh, for Wood and Smith, I think they, uh, they back up the idea that a new B, so who is a new B? A new B is uh, a newcomer to a learning group online when he or she joins the group for the first time. I said that these authors, they back up the idea that a new B, a newcomer, who would like to join the online group for the first time is expected to be obedient to the regulations set by the members of the community. For example, our students, they have groups, virtual learning groups, and I am a learner and they want to join that group. I have to by the conditions of uh, that group. So in this sense, etiquettes uh, provide the netizens. Now we speak about not the citizens, as in face-to-face. -face. We speak about the netizens, which means the network citizens, people who exist online. So the etiquettes provide them with guidelines to pursue. So... I think the purpose of uh, Nitiket is not only for adding a human element to the group, but also to make communication more effective. Not only, of course, communication, but also learning, because we speak all the time about communication within the learning uh, context. Now, let me share with you what Virginia, uh, she suggested as uh, rules of uh, uh, being or existing or belonging to a group online. So the first one, it is to remember the human. We always speak about the human side of uh, uh, the thing. So uh, uh, the first, Nitiket, remember the human, uh, it invokes the use of cognition and awareness to be aware of the people with whom you are communicating, the group to which you belong. What does this mean? This means that the user is advised, let's say, you know, advised in the first beginning to keep in mind the most common feature that is uh, uh, portrayed in the human side. So think of uh, being a human, and then the others are human beings. But from the side of uh, the other side, which means uh, the, uh, the, uh, the participants, I think all human beings have basic needs among which care is considered. So what does uh, this mean? Which means the idea of uh, a human remembrance, which means to remember the human, makes them, I mean the participants, more empathetic by putting themselves in the shoes of other online friends. By being so, they can be also careful and aware in online learning communities, which, of course, facilitates uh, friendship construction and which uh, prepares grounds for a social environment needed in instilling reciprocal respect among aligned communities set for learning. The second uh, uh, rule or guideline or netiquette is uh, adhere to the same standards of behavior online that you follow in real life. So this rule, of course, appeals to the idea that every new joiner, as I say, the new, the, the new B, has to stick to the established values in virtual learning environment, which are common for everyone and deeply rooted in the real world communication. Because we are bringing face-to-face -face reality to online 
uh, to the align one. Number three, lurk before you leap. Remember last time I talked about lurkers and lurking. So who are the lurkers? So the lurkers are passive participants online within a learning or virtual learning group or community. But in this case, when somebody joins a group for the first time, he or she should lurk before you leave. Before you act within the group, you have to think, you have to know what is going on within uh, uh, the group or the community. Of course, this norm indicates that lurking should precede the full integration within the group. And before any supposed activity within the group, before you share something within the group or with your friends in the group, the newcomer is expected to cover the maximum of the, the shared and discussed issues, which means you have to go back to the archive and to know what people were doing before you can join. So as to avoid being mistaken by breaking the rules of the bound participants. So in the same context, the knowledge principle in the online environment is a priori to get knowledgeable about the limits that should not be uh, surpassed. The fourth uh, uh, guideline or netiquette is respect other people's time and bandwidth. Of course, this guideline has to do with the, uh, the notion of time, which is uh, uh, valued within the group. That's why every shared piece of information should be concise and precise. Sometimes some people join groups and they share whatever, long texts, long articles, no, we have to take into account the time of the, the users. And remember, in pragmatics, we speak about maxims and the maxim of uh, quality and quantity so as to save others' time within the learning group. In brief, establishing relationships within or in relation to this guideline or this rule of time needs care because many people are subscribed within the group or for that group for a purpose. Uh, the fifth one is uh, make yourself look good online. Many of us should ask this question. What is good in my behavior and what is bad? and you start correcting. Now, how can you convince yourself to be good and to go online uh, better than, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing something wrong to others, etc. So the, the fifth rule says that every participant has to be positive while thinking of belonging to the group. So being good, in this sense, necessitates having positive qualities such as mutual respect and the use of uh, politeness, like uh, salutations. Many people integrate groups without saying hi, for example. You have to say hi in the first beginning. Why? Because we can strengthen our acquaintance with the others within. Uh, the group, which means we can participate in building strong relationships with others. Because learning is a process. It needs a very good atmosphere, comfortable atmosphere for both learners and teachers. The sixth one it is uh, to share expert knowledge. In this case, we need expertise in the online learning group. How? Which means the members of the group should not behave in an ordinary manner, but in a more professional way that suits the requirements 
of the, the group. Just be professional. Uh, yeah, of course, I said before that you can share experiences, but in a professional way. Uh, the seventh declaration, which has to do with the rules of uh, netiquettes or the netiquettes within virtual learning communities, is uh, or has to do with controlling causes of uh, disruptions and conflicts, which has to do with uh, uh, helping others or helping keep uh, flame wars under control, which means to control flames within the group. We are human beings, sometimes can happen. But what should we do? How can we react? Within a virtual learning community, I say learning, we have the same goals, the same interests, the same objective. It is uh, to develop ourselves, our learning, and so on. Of course, this, uh, this is uh, determined to create misunderstandings by sharing sensitive messages sometimes or comments. If you can have access to many groups, you can see some people hurting others, negative comments. So you as a professional person, learner or teacher, how can you react to such behaviors? that may result in negative emotional reactions within the group. What do you expect from people to whom you can use or you can share, for example, abusive language, impolite expressions? What do you expect from these people? So the eighth statement asserts that, or to respect others' privacy. This is a very big phenomenon in our Moroccan society, and not overgeneralizing. But sometimes we can, have, can come across these issues. This means that every individual should not make others or other members secrets public outside the group. Of course, with the intention to abuse or to attack, to underestimate, etc. So if I share with you an audio uh, some personal information, for example, within a group, we have to respect that privacy. Of course, these are dictated by uh, Virginia Xi, but we need studies. So whether people in Morocco, in our educational system, appreciate or not, having their secrets shared among others. So furthermore, private issues of others should not be shared within the group without the consent of the concerned person. You have to ask for permission. It's very simple. Can I? May I? And expect an answer, so either positive or negative. So the ninth claim is to avoid abusing one's power. So what does this mean? It is possible that one of the members of the online group is more experienced than other participants in the common field of education. And he or she may uh, misuse his or her knowledge to exercise his or her superiority over the whole group. Remember uh, Michel Foucault talking about uh, uh, power and knowledge. But participants should not underestimate other members and should believe in the online democracy. And Professor Al Karfa, I think, in uh, the first or the second uh, 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 webinar, he, talk, he talked about democratizing the e learning process for which technology has been created. So technology has been created to democratize. Uh, I talked before about the margin and the center. And uh, you can remember many events that happened all over the world, and you can see 
some people who were in the center and then they, uh, they were put in the margin, etc., and vice versa. The last uh, netiquettes uh, uh, or regulation for she is uh, to be forgiving of other people's mistakes in a virtual learning community. So the idea of uh, forgiveness is among the solid grounds upon which trust, respect, and relationships can be based. Which means, if I am tolerant, if I am peaceful, so either as a teacher or learner within a virtual learning community, of course, trust and respect and strong relationships can be set up and established. So by being also or so, by being, which means peaceful and comprehensive, the online learning group can develop. And let me, you know, come back to the first idea of social behaviors, but not to revolt against the Nietzsche case. So uh, as a conclusion, social presence, of course, is a complex construct. When I say a complex construct, it's not to create, to create a kind of uh, 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 phobia to deal with the social presence or to think of being socially present online. But to do some research on and then to decipher this complexity which can develop others to explain the effect a communication medium can have on how people communicate. The last idea, one of the most important objectives of the social presence is related to learner's satisfaction. We try to be socially present online simply because we would like to satisfy learners with the course, the instructor, and their learning. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank Sandra. you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Sir Mujid. Yeah, you are welcome, Professor. Enlightening us, enlightening us on an important issue, which is social presence. Thank you very much. You are so welcome. For your Professor. inspiring and enlightening uh, presentation. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues and uh, my dear students to interact with you and uh, with the students uh, presenters, Lubna, Iman, Nasser, and uh, Smei. Okay, and welcome. please try to be to be as brief as possible because uh, our colleagues and students are getting tired and uh, we still have three days uh, seminars, Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I would like to welcome two colleagues from the Department of uh, Philosophy. Professor Hakim Benani and Professor Bilam Qaddam. Uh, I hope they can contribute to enlighten us about some ideas, some issues related to philosophy uh, and its impact on education. The floor is yours. I welcome Professor Saidani. Once again, thank you very much for your devotion for your time and energy invested in uh, encouraging our students and the great work uh, you have been doing for their best. The floor is yours. Dear colleagues and students. Okay, sir, can I speak? Iman, you, okay. you can. Thank you. Okay, so. 
Thank you very much, dear classmates, for your insightful presentation. And thank you very much, dear Professor Jamie, for sharing plentiful ideas and helping us debunk all the complications, misunderstandings we had about the concept of social presence. Um, I actually have three questions or four. Is that okay? Yes, of course. You, you go on. Okay. Okay, so my first question is that since flipped classrooms are focused on reviewing the lecture materials ahead of time and coming to class prepared to apply what students have learned before, so can, can we consider our master classes as flipped classrooms since we tend to write reports and review the materials we are provided with before coming to class and put them into discussion? And this is the first question. The second question is directed to all professors. According to your experience, how can professors motivate students who lack the impetus to read materials ahead of time and come to class prepared with the, for the dialogic interactions and discussions in the classroom? And my third question is, what could be the possible ways to develop students' language proficiency through flipped classrooms? And the very last question is, don't you think that flipped classrooms are conundrum or um, let's say problematic for introvert students since they will feel pressured to have a dialogic interaction in the classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so first I want to express my gratitude for my dear Professor Karfa for uh, his hard work he put into the course. I would like to express my uh, thankfulness to the great professor Abdeljil Jami uh, for his wonderful presentation. Uh, well, thank you very much for your kindness and great uh, assistance. Thank you for uh, our professors, uh, Kibir Sandi, Suad Slawi, and uh, Kinza Stedani. Uh, thank you also for um, uh, our classmates for their um, uh, presentation. It was uh, very professional, successful, and fruitful. Um, uh, so I have four questions, uh, two for my classmates and two for uh, Professor Jamie. Uh, the first one is about blended learning. So to what extent blended learning can enhance collaborative and constructive learning? And how can you make sure that blended learning is a suitable and appropriate methodology for students learning? The second one is about flipped learning or flipped classroom. We say that uh, it is divided, uh, so flipped classroom, it is divided into two uh, phases. Uh, uh, pre in, uh, let's say pre-class and in-class. So the learner is asked to watch a video or, an audio, uh, or listen to a new audio um, before coming to the class. So to what extent teachers can make sure that all students watched the video or have the ability to access the network to watch the uh, video knowing that time in class does not uh, allow or always allow teachers to do quizzes um, to check students' accessibility to the materials. This is for uh, uh, my classmates. Mm. Concerning uh, uh, Professor Jamie, I have two questions. Uh, does the size of online uh, discussion groups influence students' perceptions uh, of social space, uh, group cohesion, and sociability? The second uh, question is, uh, you talked about share expert knowledge. That this means we always need uh, members uh, uh, in the group who are prominent or experts in the field to be as uh, guiders, facilitators, and the source of knowledge, uh, knowing that um, um, uh, members uh, in the group have uh, the same level. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can I can I uh, uh, answer the 
first two questions that are related to flipped classroom? Yes. Okay, so the first question uh, was uh, about master class, uh, uh, master program and flipped classroom uh, was asked about by Iman. Uh, you said that can we consider the the master uh, the uh, the way that we are the dealing with the uh, or we are learning in master program uh, uh, is more or less flipped classroom. Uh, I will be very brief I, and I and I can say yes, it is a, a flipped classroom since we are assigned uh, some pre-class uh, activities or readings. Uh, uh, well, the only difference that sometimes uh, uh, we actually not all the times that the, the professor uh, uh, need to flip the class, but from time to time the professor resort to flip in the, uh, flip the, cl the classes uh, uh, in order to uh, save the let the, the the class time for. Uh, other discussions and uh, uh, for example uh, most of the uh, the master subjects we uh, receive uh, beforehand all the reading materials uh, and then we prepare ourselves ourselves to the class so which has to do with the content the instructional content and then to check the second component that needs to be completed before coming to the class is to understand the content. How we, how the profit, uh, this answers also the, uh, the question of uh, itself about to what extent professor uh, can make sure that students uh, do the pre-class assignment. Okay, so before, uh, so the second component of the pre-class assignment is understanding. The instructional content. The professor uh, at the level of the master uh, program assign uh, a kind of report. A uh, report is a way to check that the student understand the material. Okay? And uh, the, the professor also may uh, devise a short uh, quiz in which uh, the uh, the student can check himself his understanding. Uh, it's called a, a self graded quiz that can be made online. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, for the other levels, for example, uh, uh, in the high uh, in high school, <clears throat> the same uh, same can be done. The teacher can assign online quizzes. Uh, that need to be complemented or finished before coming to class, or uh, once the uh, students come to the class, the teacher can distribute uh, some uh, uh, like uh, some worksheets or uh, questions in which the the the, st the student need to answer, and then later on the, the teacher will collect these uh, answers and check whether or not the student understood. And then he can or she can, I mean the professor, address individual questions to the student. Well, hope my answer uh, will uh, satisfy your, uh, well, your, your inquiries, your research inquiries. And if you need more uh, clarification, uh, I am ready for that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Any other question, please? Yes, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, dear professors. I would like to thank my classmates, uh, Iman, Lubna, Nasser, and Ismail, and, and also Professor Jamie for their uh, very helpful presentation. Actually, I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to give my opinion. So, uh, as far as my point of view is concerned, uh, blended learning is very important in learning and helpful. Why? Because it simply does uh, solve uh, uh, a real obstacle that we have in learning, which is the time constraint. So that is to say, instead of spending um, uh, the majority of time on lectures, uh, we can use this, ta this time for discussion and interaction between students. And uh, thus moving from uh, uh, passive learn learning to active learning, 
from uh, teacher centeredness to uh, student centeredness and giving the students uh, the opportunity to participate in their own learning. Uh, as for the disadvantages of uh, blended learning, I think that some of the limitations of uh, blended learning can be uh, simply solved. For example, I have one uh, disadvantage mentioned by uh, my friend Lubna, which is uh, technology illiteracy. And I think this limitation, for example, can be solved by uh, establishing uh, training programs for students and also for uh, teachers to train them on using uh, the technology. And thank you. Yes. Any more question, please? Yes. Can I say some few words, please? Yes, yes Dr. Slim. Yes, any question? Any more question before okay, you can, can start? start yeah. Yes, Sabdu, you can. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, so, well, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, see uh, Sophie. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Uh, well, thanks, dear professors, uh, Professor Al-Karfa, for giving me a chance to share my ideas, and thanks, uh, all professors. Thanks, Professor Jami, for your insightful presentation. Thanks to the master students for their excellent presentations as well. Well, just uh, my question is addressed to um, C. Abil Hassan. You said that in one of the, the, uh, the implications you reported, you said that uh, the use or the adoption of flipped classrooms uh, lead to high performance for students. So what kind of performance uh, you talked about? Uh, do we mean, I mean, in terms of writing, in terms of speaking, in terms of skills development? So what do you mean, what do you mean here? Uh, you talked also about that the adoption of flipped classrooms, uh, I mean, help students to avoid or to overcome, I mean, academic difficulties. So what are those academic difficulties? Uh, uh, and then another uh, remark, I would call it, uh, I mean, questioning of uh, the concepts, how can we talk, or where, uh, how can we talk about teacher-centeredness, wherein the teacher, or the, the roles that assigned to the teacher within the uh, teacher-centeredness is, uh, I would mention, a guide, an assistant, a facilitator, a counselor, organizer, to name but a few. So where, where is the uh, learner-centeredness here? And I, th because I think that, the, uh, there is much pressure, uh, I mean, put on the teacher, I mean, compared to the uh, more, uh, to the uh, old uh, teacher centeredness. Uh, concerning uh, teacher, uh, sorry, Professor Jamey, I would like to thank him for his inclusive, I mean, presentation. Uh, it was very inclusive because I like the way how he presented his ideas, touching upon different disciplines, giving examples from different disciplines. So, uh, I mean, from literature, from, uh, I mean, our so, so society and so on and so forth. My question to their Professor Jamey, uh, we know, of course, that uh, I mean, students, okay, uh, of course, when they join a virtual learning community, they come with a, with a certain culture. They come with, with a culture. Uh, so when they join that group, uh, you said that to, I mean, oblige them uh, to respect those 10 rules. So how, what, uh, I mean, what, what would guarantee that those students would accept I mean, and abide by those rules you talked about. And thank you. Yes, Professor Jamie, can you please react to those three questions, please? Yeah, thank you, Professor Slawi. Okay. Uh, thank you, colleagues and uh, students. Okay, so uh, the first question of uh, uh, Insaf Khudri. You know, thank you first, you know, for your question. Uh, you raised the issue of uh, uh, class size uh, in e-learning. Yes. So, uh, first of all, uh, e-learning uh, emerged or has emerged to solve the problem of uh, the size in higher education. Uh, but sometimes, you know, let's uh, talk, you know, frankly, and this is reality that we cannot ignore, that uh, the job will be very hard for uh, the teacher or the professor uh, to give feedback. Uh, let me focus on uh, feedback because it is very interesting stage in the learning process. But uh, if, if, it is, if there is the problem of uh, giving feedback, we can solve it by uh, the presentation that I delivered last time by synchronicity and asynchronicity. So uh, if, for example, it is not possible for the professor to give immediate feedback, it could be a delayed feedback. 
And here we can use the uh, asynchronous option, which means the offline option of uh, 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 giving feedback to solve the problem of uh, the class size. So the second question uh, asked by, uh, by the same uh, uh, person is uh, in Safudi. Uh, talking about uh, sharing knowledge, is it necessary to need somebody in the group you know, to, to learn from? So to speak about learning, there must be always a source of uh, knowledge. We need always you know, a source. But in your opinion, so who can be the source and from where we can generate information and uh, knowledge? For example, or imagine uh, I read an article as a teacher or as a learner uh, on uh, issues in, apply, uh, in applied linguistics. So as a member of the community, when I say the community, which means we share many things in common. We don't speak about the I, but we speak about the we which means I experience responsibility. I feel more responsible to share knowledge. And here uh, I can say something else. Imagine uh, uh, information or knowledge uh, was not and has not been shared by some people. Can we or are we going to be knowledgeable about different issues? In learning, in education, in life, etc. So we need always a source, you know, for that. And thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. You are welcome. Any other questions? May, may I have a word, please? Yes, yes, for sure. Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hello, professors. I would like to thank all professors contributing in this um, event. Event. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, in particular, uh, Arfa and uh, I see Abdulmajid, Professor Abdulmajid, for his inspiring um, uh, presentation. All the rest of the course, uh, they were great in presenting and, uh, and uh, giving uh, that valuable content. I'd like just to share. Um, I mean, to to widen the the circle of of contributors to this. Uh, blended learning and say that. Um, I mean, uh, in addition to students and teachers who has, have to uh, change their mindset concerning this blended learning, I would like to add um, something very important I mean, and, and, and a very important uh, contributor is the job market. Because by the end, all the students are going to seek for a job now, I, I mean here that uh, hiring companies should change their, their mindset and look for uh, those, let's say, uh, experts or future experts in these platforms. And I, I refer here to Popenisi 2015, who said that um, a company may design individual with a specific or technical expertise taught via a certain platform like MOOC for students who don't know this uh, platform. It's uh, massive open online courses offered by an accredited institution. And let me tell you here that um, Morocco has um, now, uh, let's say, uh, established a sort of uh, MOOC. They call it a Mar MOOC. It's, it stands for Mark, Maroc or Morocco. MOOCs, okay? So it means that Morocco is now equipped with um, certain, let's say, platforms. They, um, they uh, just uh, went for a lot of uh, partnerships with a lot of uh, institutions and a lot of uh, uh, companies. And now they can, of course, attract, they can attract, but this is the question I would like Seb Lemjid or any other professors to uh, uh, answer this question. How could uh, those institutions, universities, uh, 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 attract the, let's say, the hiring companies, okay, to come and see what we call the sort of record of students, uh, let's say, projects, students, uh, uh, interest, students, assignments, 
and uh, try to look for their, let's say, um, uh, sort of uh, specific technical uh, expertise uh, in, in those platforms. Why not? Right. So uh, let us mm, agree upon that the, on the fact, of course, all institutions now okay, are equipped okay, are well equipped and they are ready uh, to do this type of uh, learn uh, or what we call blended learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mr. Homish. Yes. So yes, madam. Uh, I'd like to thank every professor for their continuous efforts and uh, to all dear students for their great contributions and special thanks to C. Janay who has enlightened us about the inside uh, perspective of uh, education and technology. So first of all, just I'd like to share some points and uh, that's how intrigued my interests and my uh, curiosity. So now I think it's not a matter of whether being pro or against technology, as uh, Terry Sherkel said in one of her uh, articles, the, she is a sociologist and she's talking a lot about, she's looking at technology from a social perspective. So uh, one of her texts, actually, I taught them to my students. And since students are encouraged to use their critical thinking skills, she, she was critical actually of uh, technology for communication. So, so she was highly, uh, do you hear me? It's okay, the voice? Yes, of course we hear you. Yes, thank you so much. So uh, actually the student didn't like her ideas because she was critical of uh, using technology. But she ended up her, her uh, he say with the idea that I'm not against technology, I'm pro conversation. So here we are going to adopt this idea in education. So actually there are many issues that have been existent in uh, education, whether it's physical surrounding or e-surrounding, that is to say whether it's face-to-face -face or uh, e-learning. So like the idea of motivation, the idea of interaction, the idea of engagement, the idea of achievements, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the idea now is how can we, I mean, empower ourselves, whether students or uh, teachers to deal with this, because it has become a reality. And the other thing that uh, we have to take into account is the parent involvement. How can we involve parents? Because we have faced this as parents. Uh, how can we uh, encourage them to make their kids uh, self independence actually, or self-dependence? Uh, the idea that uh, I'd like to uh, add is, Sir uh, Hassan uh, said that many students come with, uh, when he was talking about flipped, uh, uh, learning as a mode of uh, blended learning. And I'd like to thank you a lot for clarifying a lot of concepts because it's, it's really challenging when it comes to concept definitions and, and, and uh, defining. Uh, the, many students come with zero knowledge and uh, we have studied in pedagogy that we have to tap into students' background knowledge and to make use of students' background knowledge, whether to build new knowledge or to question it and, and change it. So I think, I think students' background knowledge can be made use of instead of being uh, erased. Uh, the last point that I would just uh, to end is with disciplines. Uh, it is true that uh, English professors and teachers are, are open to change and they tend to have this uh, growth mindset. What about the other disciplines? Do we have any knowledge about the other departments, other, other uh, disciplines, are they ready? Because, because this is really important, even whether we talk about those uh, reforms, bridging the gap between across disciplines, for example, in Islamic uh, departments, in Arabic departments, because learners, are, we are not just uh, teaching learners in separation with the other disciplines. And, and now the philosophy that focuses on uh, learner-centered uh, 
it is really important. We tend to be innovative. We tend to be to give more responsibility to, to learners. But those learners are also taught by other teachers, by other disciplines. And, and uh, from from my humble experience, I have faced this. Sometimes it, I, I tried flipped classroom with my students. I gave them many tasks to do at home, and the classroom comes for reflection, for hands-on activities. But when I was at find out, I did a kind of exit uh, ticket, kind of uh, post or summative uh, assessment, and they found that students were not uh, satisfied with that activity. They were, and then when I asked why, and this was anonymous to make it more objective, when I asked why, uh, you said uh, we were expecting the teacher to step in and to give more support and scaffolding and scaffolding. So, so here it puts us whether our learners are, are ready for this uh, learner centered uh, approach. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Sophie, for Professor? raising up. Uh, please, Sorry, can I? Please? May I? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Sophie, for raising up very pertinent issues which are really in need of further research and investigation because i think yeah, this is not the case for all the departments in our university okay so it is if it is a case of english departments french departments probably but not for all other departments like arabic departments or islamic department or other departments yes and even for uh, and the graduate classes, I think, because for master classes, we, you can control and apply those flipped classes to have uh, kind of flipped classrooms. But what about large group uh, classes, like, for example, what we have in undergraduate uh, classes at our university, where you have 100 students and more sometimes? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And of course, the, uh, the, our guest speaker is also uh, can answer this question as well as our uh, presenters. And the floor is yours, uh, the student who wants to ask questions. Yes, please. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. Yes, Mr. So, uh, I, yeah, I hope you are doing well and you are in good health. Uh, so I would like to thank you, Professor Jamey, for your outstanding and insightful uh, presentation. I much I, I really enjoy it. So I also I would like to thank you all my professors at Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University Faculty of Business and Science So I have just indeed one question to you, Professor, mm -hmm. which is: To what extent can we consider? The Moroccan learners and professors at universities respect the 10 rules of the virtual learning that you talked about, Professor. Mm -hmm. So this is And yes. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ilham. Yes, of course, uh, the presenter. The, 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 yes, the, uh, Professor Slawi. Yes, yes I, Professor Jamie. The floor yes, is uh, yours. Yeah, I would like you know to thank uh, Professor Abdurrahim Khubish and uh, Sikarim and all the uh, participants uh, and uh, Ilham, you know, for asking this uh, question of uh, Moroccan learners and teachers within uh, virtual learning communities and the extent to which they uh, well and the extent to which they uh, respect uh, the rules. So of course, uh, it's very hard to control. Uh, uh, those learning communities and uh, the behaviors of learnings, learners. But uh, sometimes we speak about, let me say, you know, uh, two words. Sometimes if it is, for example, a uh, Facebook group or WhatsApp group, for example, we speak always about the admins. There's always an administrator that uh, controls, uh, uh, you know, the misbehaviors of uh, 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 the participants. So, which means if somebody does something wrong, he may be uh, uh, blocked or uh, or removed from uh, uh, the group. This is uh, one. Uh, sometimes you can speak about, especially when it comes to uh, the academia, so the, the platforms used by some universities. Let me give an example of uh, 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 Hassan the uh, First University in Sittat. So, we have platforms. Uh, you know where uh, 
uh, we work uh, with uh, our students, but you can control uh, the platform and also the, there is always an administrator behind that. Another person that uh, controls over everything, which means it is an institutional control over these uh, uh, misbehaviors. So which means it's easy uh, to be controlled. And if uh, you said the, the learner, uh, the teachers, uh, I don't think that, that the teacher misbehaves within groups. I don't think so. Yeah. But sometimes uh, it may happen, you know, from some intruders and they may say uh, they, sometimes they may not be uh, students and they can use, uh, as I said last time, uh, an avatar, a fake name, uh, a fake identification, fake identity, and then they, uh, they join uh, some groups sometimes and they create some problems or blaming, as I said before. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, Adin Shamey for You're your outstanding, insightful and inspiring presentation and all mm -hmm. the expertise you allowed us to benefit from uh, for, within this session. Yes, of course, the, thank you very much our dear uh, students, mainly uh, the presenters, Mr. Uh, Mudni, Mr. SME Hassan, Hassani, Hassan, and also the other two uh, presenters, uh, Iman and uh, Khodri, I think. Yes, thank you for your excellent presentations. You were doing very well. And thank you for the other students for and other colleagues for enriching this webinar with their questions, inquiries, additions, and comments. Okay, so the floor is to Professor Khalfa to close up and to wrap up this session. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, my turn would like to okay. express my thanks and gratitude to our colleagues, uh, Professor Khalid Bizar, the Dean of the Faculty of Letters and the Human Sciences, for his uh, efforts and uh, encouragement. Professor Slawi, the coordinator of this master program, who has been investing great efforts for the best of our students. And uh, I would like to uh, thank my colleagues from the Department of uh, Philosophy, Professor Hakim Benani and uh, Professor Belem Qaddam. My colleagues uh, in the Department of English. Um, Professor Benis, Professor Karim Abelghiti, uh, Professor Kenza uh, Sedani, Professor Sandi, Professor Gordou, Professor Jami and uh, Humish. And uh, uh, I wish I haven't forgotten any one of my colleagues. We are so grateful. Mm, and our my congratulations. Huh? Students, PhD students, uh, we have a doctoral students with us. Uh, yes, PhD, PhD students, yes. And uh, of course, um, students of the master program in general and the presenters in particular. Uh, your presentations uh, have been so insightful, and uh, I can guess and imagine the great efforts behind and the readings that you have uh, done. Uh, this is uh, what expect our students to do. Uh, congratulations. We, uh, we know the uh, barriers, the constraints, many constraints that you face and that you encounter and uh, that you have overcome successfully. Congratulations again and again and again. And uh, I would like to uh, remind you that next uh, Wednesday, we, uh, we have a distinguished guest from the University of uh, London, Professor Jean Mark, Professor of Applied Linguistics and Communication. And uh, 
I will join him in discussing characteristics, good characteristics of uh, learners and uh, learning. Uh, Thursday we have our one. We will have our wonderful um, guest, uh, C. Amin Udriri, on language uh, awareness, language awareness, which is uh, um, uh, which is not widely debated anyway. It is purely uh, academic, and uh, because online and e-learning is. Uh, now publicly debated. Uh, on Friday, inshallah, we have our friend and colleague, uh, specialist Siad Mujid Bouzian, uh, on uh, and Professor Karim Abriti, our dear colleague from the Department of English, the Faculty of Letters and Human Sciences, on online, on uh, assessment in general, and. Uh, online assessment in particular, which is a timely issue, which is an aching issue for policymakers, for teachers, for students as well. So um, they're ready for the next three days. Okay, the next three days. Uh, our dean will be, will join us, will give a, an introductory uh, speech to introduce and welcome our guests during the three days. Um, I think the president of Sidi Mohammed University, uh, Professor Van joining us on one of these the three days, three seminars. Um, uh, thank you all because the success uh, of these uh, seminars are used. Thanks to your engagement, to your sacrifice, uh, things are getting better and we are learning, everybody, everyone on this uh, virtual uh, event is learning. We are learning from each other. We are learning to cope with technical matters. I myself have learned a lot from, you know, because I, I, okay, so I have been put in a situation for the first time. So I have been learning from you, from my children, from my friends, from now we, we feel uh, more uh, at ease, okay? Um, uh, that's all, just one idea, a uh, very important question that, uh, has been uh, raised by uh, one of the, our students, which is related to uh, how uh, institutions of higher education, what institutions of higher education should do. All I can say, given the conditions we have found ourselves in, um, teachers, students, parents, uh, institutions, policy makers, given the conditions, exceptional times uh, we have found ourselves in, uh, they have reacted quickly. They have done the best, okay, to make these meetings the continuity of uh, learning and teaching possible. It is not time and it is not the mood to uh, criticize. Of course, there are weaknesses, there are strengths that uh, all stakeholders, I hope, will uh, evaluate, stop at them, and uh, find ways to improve uh, our practices, our trainings, okay? Uh, congratulations and thanks to the families they have engaged. Imagine, right to guess, money, uh, talking in terms of money, uh, parents have invested, have spent on providing their uh, children, their 
uh, data and signs to make it possible. How many phones they have bought, how many connections, uh, internet they have paid, etc. I can imagine that at least in two months, three months, some of them may have spent um, the total of one month at least salary. I imagine 10,000 their hands. Uh, some of them, those who have more than one key in uh, at school and others at university, how much money, okay, they have uh, spent. So uh, hats off to the families first, parents, students, who have managed to overcome um, psychological stress and uh, some new social organization at home. Our homes uh, have been uh, not only flipped, but, uh, okay, they have been inverted wherever you go, all the rooms, no special rooms, books, uh, laptops, things everywhere. And thanks to this kind of chaos, we have come to overcome this. Uh, thank you all for your engagement. Our meeting, inshallah, next Wednesday. Rahim, one word if you allow me. Yes, Take care of the, the president, our president, the president of our department, Siki no, 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 I would like to thank you warmly, warmly, for what you have done and for what you are doing, because you are bringing a great, a great consciousness, if I can say, to, to us all, to students, to, 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 to teachers, and this, thanks to this initiative, which is very excellent. Thank you from the depth of my heart. And I have to admit something. When I started, the first time I thought of this seminar, it was, um, let me say, a joke. Yeah. I didn't expect it was a joke. Uh, you know, why not? Uh, really? Wallah, I didn't expect it to happen the way it is. It is beyond expectations. I wanted to do something for my students. So they contacted people and they say yeah. They said yes. Okay. I sent emails. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yes. I sent emails and uh, uh, our colleagues uh, uh, reacted uh, on the spot. They say yes. Everyone is ready. This is why we have to be positive. I sent yeah. the email yeah. and they said yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They did not hesitate. Very good. Them, yeah. uh, special thanks to them, Moroccan people and human beings. Uh, you know, when you create, it suffices, it's enough to create positive environment. Yeah. And, uh, this kind of community. We are friends. We are colleagues. Uh, okay. We, we, we love our students, our country, and we try yeah. to help. Everyone is helping. Thank you very much, Professor Slawi. Uh, see, Kibir, everyone is doing his, uh, in the Department of English, is doing his best and her best to serve students. Yeah. We are not the best. We are not competent, uh, I don't know, in all issues and uh, in uh, technical things. No, we are not engineers. But um, when your heart and your mind join yeah. together, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, you, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. When they meet, one's heart and, uh, and mind, things become, become possible. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Professor Al-Kharfa. <laughs> Let me just say, say a word. You know. Yes, uh, Professor. Uh, yes, I, I would like you know, to thank warmly uh, Professor Slawi, the coordinator, and uh, Professor uh, Sandy, uh, the chairman, Professor Al-Kharfa, you know, the leader, and the perfect uh, students who have uh, done you know, a very good job. Uh, I'm very happy, I'm very glad uh, to join you, and uh, I wish you the best of luck, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Professor, I guess. Thank you. I guess Mohamed yeah. Bukhari has nice. the voice. Yeah, yes, I guess Mohamed yeah. has not me. One of the, one of the students has some yes. the voice. I'll give her the voice. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Who wants to speak, Iman? Who wants to speak? Uh, yes, dear Professor Slavi, I am the one. Yes, of course. I, I am really, I am really sorry for being late because I have just, I have, I, I have been facing some technical problems concerning low access to data. I am really sorry for being very no late. Problem. I know. No worries. Don't have, uh, Those things happen, my dear. Yes, come thank on. You. Thank you very much. First and foremost, I would like just to express my limitless thanks to our dear professor and our coordinator of this master program. Professor uh, Slawi for her, her great efforts, as well as our outstanding Professor Al-Qarfa, as well for his unbelievable efforts in this chaotic situation. Mm -hmm. So thank you a lot. Thank you to our Professor Kibir Sandy and our Professor Sadani for, for their attendance and support, attendance, support and motivation. Thank you a lot. Thank you, uh, my uh, dear classmates, for, their, for your outstanding presentation from which we have benefited a lot. And also my wholehearted thanks goes to uh, Professor Abdelmajid, uh, uh, Abdelmajid al Jami for his, of course, outstanding presentation, his second presentation from which, again, we benefited a lot. And thank you a lot for your informative and inf insightful uh, ideas. And also my thanks goes to all the uh, respectful professors attending with us this fifth uh, webinar of this masterclass webinar se series. So thank you a lot. I would like just to add two important thank issues, you, if you allow me. In... For your okay, thank you very yes. much. Maybe one minute, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. Yes, you can thank... speak, Mr. Thank you a lot. So uh, the first one, I think that with, uh, I will say, uh, with digital and social media became uh, a part and parcel of the, uh, I will say, the, the life of learners. I do believe that, uh, 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 I do believe that a uh, classroom or flipped classroom has has become has become or learning has become part and parcel of flipped classroom uh, or flipped classroom sorry has become part and parcel of of, of our learning process and uh, I, I say that I, and here I would like to mention two important things if you don't mind which we didn't uh, mention within this of course outstanding webinar the first one, the first is the role of the teacher and second the role of the students because here we need really to take into consideration the role of the students as well as the role of the teacher. So on the one hand, I do believe that teachers should really create a, 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 a learning environment that really, uh, I would say, uh, a learning environment that supports the students' participation in this, of course, uh, issue. And second, uh, we shouldn't deny the role of teach the role of students who should really, again, uh, should really participate and should watch the videos and do their home assignments beforehand in order to be ready to be ready for this, of course, uh, for, for their lessons and for the uh, the course uh, as a whole. And concerning the use of technology that we have been talking about since the first online webinar until today, I do believe that technology has become very substantial, I think, in uh, the, Moro the whole Moroccan education system. So with the word uh, uh, moving so rapidly towards, I will say, digital and uh, in the digital media and information, I do believe that, that technology has become very substantial, not only in education, but I will say, how can I put it, has become one of the building blocks of our society. That's why the use of, an, of a technology integrated teaching and learning has become very, very important in order to, 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 to create uh, or in order to create uh, an atmosphere that supports the process of teaching and learning. And uh, one final issue, and correct me if I am wrong, I do believe, I largely do believe that we really lack, uh, I will say, uh, a clear vision towards the integration of technology in our education system, meaning that we, we don't have a, a, really a, a clear or we have no clear governmental policy in this issue. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kouli, for your, the, uh, the, the interesting thoughts you have expressed and for the addition you made. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you a lot, dear Professor. Big, big thank you to CMK Amiri. Um, the engineer who is working in the in the shadow is behind. Okay, the curtains behind the scene. 
he it is the Mki Amiri who has been uh, you know designing uh, the webinars writing and rewriting and posting and okay on facebook uh, sending emails on my behalf okay so thank you very much Mki uh, Amiri for the great efforts you have been doing for the best of your friends Thank you, Thank you all, Welcome. and bye bye. Thank Good you very much. For now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 بغيت تبقى معاهم الله يعاونك انا المهم راه نعي استاذ رحيم واش باقي 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 الجمعي جمعي ما نعرف باقي السي مكي جمعي لا واقي ما مشى ولكن غنعيدو يرجع عيط 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 اه غدا نعيطوا الاستاذه وتشرب القهوه انا شوف واحد الخاصيه كنتلاقى انا وياك فيها 100% هي القهوه و و دابا غادي نتسناك غنتسناك اييه وغندير عليك شهود وغنعيط الاستاذه في الصباح ان شاء الله نسلم واخا ونعيط لك وهذا ما تفصلش غادي نعيط الاستاذه ونشرب قهوه انا وياها وندبر راسي شاكر شاكر يا لا نعيط غدا ان شاء الله مع ال11 واش مشى الجمعي مشى الجمعي اه امشى ما كيجاوبش في التليفون صافي واقيلا لاش غيكون تيشارجالو بالنهايه ديال او دي بغينا نقول ليه عيش شكرا لان البريزونطاسيون كانت مخيره هو دا هو هو جاوب بس الجمعي كيسولو فيك ارجع ارجع اخذ ارجع راه واحد السؤال راه عاد جا كيسول فيك الاستاذ ساندي لا اه هو جاي هو جاي تبارك الله عليك سي مكي تبارك الله عليك يو هاف اول ذا تايم دان جريت جوب ذيس از ذا ليست اي كان دو از اكسلنت انتم علمتونا قبل تبارك الله عليك سي شكرا استاذ سلاوي الله يبارك فيك استاذ بارك الله عليك ها السي الجمعي جا سي الجمعي كاين اخي راك السلام عليكم ها هو معي وعليكم السلام وي للاسف تي درتي راه كي بقيت استاذي استاذي العزيز راك مطلوب سي ساندي تبارك الله عليكم استاذ القرف لا انا اللي بغيت نقول لك شكرا جزيلا الله يا ودي The presentation was more than excellent. Thanks a lot. It was it was rich, deep, and full of of things. Thank you so much. If we continue discussing now, we will not finish. There are many important things. Thank you very much. 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 أستاذ سلاوي بارك الله فيكم والله يلقينا في شي ساعة مبروك إن شاء الله. شكرا شكرا لا لا انا ما انا ما كنشوفش انا ما مزيان لي بارتيسيبون كنبقى نشكر غير على الله شكرا الله عليك شكرا استاذ شكرا استاذ القرفه شكرا المهم غنبقى صافي راه عندي واحد اللائحه راه ولات بيرمان وكنشكر كل شيء هو كنشكرو اللهم زيادة ولا نقص الله
الله يعاونك المهم شوف سالي الميتينغ من عندك وصافي باي 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 على خير على خير هذا ما سلام على خير تبارك الله عليكم تبارك الله عليكم سلام لا ما كلمه سلام استاذه سلام استاذه سلام استاذه تبارك الله عليكم سلام انت سلام استاذه باي باي